All right, good evening, everybody. Just imagine. Yeah. This whole. This is the uh, the bell has been rung and counselors, time to uh, start the meeting and welcome members of the public. Um, this is the Northampton City Council meeting of December fifth, twenty nineteen. My name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'll be running the meeting. Uh, these proceedings are being audio and video recorded, and we're going to start with public comment. A sign up sheet. But if you haven't signed up, it's okay. You can still talk. And I'm aware that there are uh, there is there is one public hearing on the agenda tonight. And so you may speak during the comment, and you may also speak during the public hearing, um, or you may choose, or or whatever. So we're just happy to hear from you. Uh, so let me start down uh, the list. First is Stephen Callahan. Stephen, you've come up, and the floor is all yours. Hi, I'm Steve Callahan. I live at 824 Birch Pit Road, and uh, I've worked in the city 30 years. I've been retired and working as a volunteer medical driver for the Senior Center. And I'm here tonight, not with happy news in terms of what's going on at the Senior Center, but uh, the director of the program, Medical Ride, left about six weeks ago. Since then, there have been no rides any of the seniors. Last year, during the time period, there were 40 rides. We've received one email. I sent out emails to all of the volunteer drivers. I got responses from seven. They've received nothing. We've received no communication from the director of the program in terms of what's going to go on. Whether the program has ended, I don't know or not. But it's disturbing because, again, we provide services usually to people who are unable to drive, they might be visually impaired, okay? They might be recovering from an accident, okay? And need a ride, you know, for PT. And these people who, they love the city. In fact, they come in and when in the car, they always say to me, this is such a great, a great service. And I said, well, that's what Northampton is. That's the kind of town it is. It's decent, it's caring, it's respectful, okay? and." We're the type of people, that's, that's why this, this, I mean, it is Northampton. I mean, I drive down Main Street, people stop to walk and you stop and they smile and they walk by. I mean, if you go to Boston and New York, they look at you suspiciously like, you know, what are you planning to do, you know, in terms of crossing. But I'm also disturbed to the fact that this appears to be at least the third time we've talked about chocolate bars, we've talked about bridge groups, where there's been a situation with sort of poor judgment, and then no follow-up or communication. It doesn't take but one minute to email all 10 drivers who are all on one list. And for it to go six weeks, as I say, there were 40 medical rides last year. To the best of my knowledge, there were none during the past six weeks. Okay? So, I mean, that's what I have to say, but it's a very sad situation. And it, believe me, it's a lot worse for those people, particularly as the winter comes, when they're trying to get around in their walker, okay, or if they're legally blind. Well, I appreciate that, and it's a, it's a good reminder for me to tell everyone in the public, it's kind of awkward in public comments sometimes because people will bring very substantive, important issues, and our rules prohibit us right now from having a back and forth. Yep, that's fine. But I invite you and anyone else to email me personally or call me personally or your counselor where you can have that conversation. And for the record, I have gotten suspicious looks myself in Northampton when walking <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Callahan. Um, next is uh, Laurie Loisel, please. Hi, I'm Laurie Loisel from 46 Grant Avenue. I wanted to speak in favor in support of the Safe Communities Act, which I know you're taking second vote on tonight. I'm a member of the Northampton Human Rights Commission. We see this as a matter of basic human rights. Um, also a member, a congregation member of the Unitarian Society and a member of the board there. We have a woman living in our basement who has lived there for 20 months. Um, she's uh, it, fighting her deportation. She has three children who were born in this country. She's married to a man who was born in this country. She's the family, <coughs> the primary breadwinner for the family. Um, it defies all logic and human compassion to think about deporting this woman. and. I see this as a, a, w a, a further um, declaration as um, the city did with the mayor's proclamation or whatever that was called, executive order. 
Um, but I feel like this is really good for the city council to take this step too, um, to codify it. And um, I basically think this is the least we can do as a community. So I encourage you all to vote yes again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I may mispronounce your name. Uh, Claire Lob Lobdell. Lobdell yeah. Thank you. The floor is yours. Yes. Um, I'm Claire Lobdell. I live at 47 Fairview Avenue. Um, I'm speaking in support of Order 19.183, the proposal to hold a special election on March 3rd, 2020, for a budget override. Um, I asked the City Council to vote in favor of this <coughs> and to put a budget override on the ballot. When Mayor Narkowitz asked for the last budget override in 2013, it was designed to last for four years, but um, through the mayor and the council's careful stewardship of those funds, uh, that override money extended for six years. Thank you for using our taxes so judiciously. I look around Northampton and see my tax dollars used in ways that make this a great place to live. Um, every few days, my family visits Pulaski Park, which was renovated after the last override. Um, I run and bike on the bike paths every week. I love the public shade tree project that's planted hundreds of trees around the city over the past few years. It helps us mitigate the effects of climate change and it is not free. Um, my husband, a cyclist, enjoys riding on the newly repaved Glendale Road, Birds Pit, Chesterfield Road, Spring Street. Um, we're grateful for Forbes Library's wonderful <coughs> staff and expanded hours. I'm the parent of two <coughs> children at Bridge Street School where they are both thriving, and um, I'm proud of our public schools and the education that our talented educators provide. Northampton Public Schools, which are the largest portion of the city's budget, are also very careful with taxpayer funds. Um, the city faces budget shortfalls over the coming years if we do not pass an override. I'm happy to pay more taxes if it means maintaining the schools and other city services that make this such a great place to live. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Adele Franks, please. Committee on Pesticide Reduction uh, final report, and I'm here tonight to speak in favor of the ordinance to protect children from pesticide exposure. Uh, for those who uh, who weren't here last week, um, our select committee was uh, what learned um, during our exploration that Northampton has no official enduring policies um, requiring people safe from pesticides and uh, so we made a number of recommendations and one of, one of those recommendations is represented tonight in an ordinance to protect children from pesticides on municipal property so I wanted to um, speak in favor of that I uh, hope you will uh, unanimously approve that ordinance I think it is a small step in the right direction and it's very important to take that first step in the right direction what it does is it codifies existing informal policy into a formal policy, and um, my hope is that you will all see that that has great merit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Franks. Appreciate that. Um, Lily Lombard, please. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Lily Lombard. I live at 39 Monroe Street. There's so many things. There's, um, Can you not? There's hearing assistance. Systems in the back there. Maybe NC um, two thing. Maybe NCTV has heard that issue. That we, if it's possible to turn it up, we can. And if anyone needs special hearing assistant devices, that we have those available in the hallway. And we'll reset the timer, and, and Lily can speak loudly for all of us. Thank you, and I won't speak for my full time. Um, but I, I just hearing the two previous, the three previous speakers before me, I realize that there's a lot of wonderful things to support tonight. So I'd like to lend my voice in support of the Pesticide Reduction Ordinance, the resolution regarding the Safe Communities Act, and the proposal to put the override on the ballot for Northampton. I think those are all um, excellent decisions. I'm proud to stand behind all of them. Um, as a, the former director of Grow Food Northampton who brought some, uh, raised some of the alarms around pesticide in the city, um, it's very um, rewarding for me to see that this has gone full measure 
under the um, careful uh, tutelage of Adele and Councillor Klein. I thank them for the hard work and the compromises that they had to uh, achieve among the various stakeholders um, to arrive at this ordinance. For me, it's not the perfect ordinance, but it is the ordinance that I want to get behind tonight because I think it's a step in the right direction, as Adele said. Um, I think that uh, there's uh, plenty of evidence to show that uh, organic methods of, um, of dealing with pests um, pay for themselves over time. The initial investments, of course, over time pay for themselves. And then, of course, the, the uh, external costs that we don't easily put a price on, that is the health of our children, the health of our soils, the health of our planet, um, they are um, invaluable to us and should be factored in when we consider adopting these measures. So thank you for your time. And thank you. Uh, Jesse Adams, former councillor at large. Welcome back. Thank you. I'm here to speak in favor of adopting MGL Chapter 138, Section 12. I was very happy to learn that the License Commission has made a recommendation and that it passed and that you'll be considering it tonight. As you all well know, there are very draconian state laws that punish Northampton for its success. And this type of measure will um, <clears throat> be a great benefit to the business community, specifically the restaurant community. Um, <clears throat> and it'll offset some of that unfairness. So I, I, I respectfully request that you pass this. Um, it'll help businesses, it'll help new businesses like Highbrow. I'm here tonight with Andrew Brow from Highbrow. And, um, and that's important. I also want to thank the mayor for putting this forward along with the Liquor License Commission. The mayor has been very good about this issue and, and helping Highbrow um, specifically. Thank you very much. Thank you for your service. I've served with nearly all of you, and that was one of the greatest professional honors I've had. And thank you very much for considering this, and I hope you pass it. Good night. Thank you. Uh, I'll echo the honor that I felt uh, serving with you as well. And so thanks for your comments on, on that subject. So now we're going to go to Megan Paik. This ordinance is consistent with the mission of the Human Rights Commission to recognize and uphold the dignity and rights of all of our residents, regardless of their citizenship status. Um, it notably affects most of the people that are probably not present in this room, um, who do not share the safety of privilege of participating in the political process. They are, as we know, um, more likely to be victims than perpetrators of discrimination and crimes. Um, they may not be more inclined to report abuses against their persons, but the rest of us could have more confidence in reporting on their behalf, knowing that their data would not be misused or shared to their detriment, and that our municipal resources would not be deputized by the federal government towards their deportation. Um, this ordinance is an important first action, and the passage will not only provide protections for needed by immigrants, but allow citizen residents to be better allies and advocates for the undocumented. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Uh, Mark uh, Cody? Co Hello. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. So my name is Mark Cody. Um, I'm a local community activist. Um, and organizer with several political groups. Um, I'm also a resident at 73 Barrett um, in Northampton, and I've lived here my entire life. 
Um, I'm here in support of the, um, well, actually several different things that are going to be voted on today. Um, the um, thing in support of immigrants, the safety ordinance, um, as well as the thing on pesticides, but also primarily here in support of the override. Um, I think it's really important that we remember that this was something that was originally supposed to the previous vote to last only for four years, and it was able to last for six. So it's very important that we have that on the ballot so voters have a chance to decide, you know, to make sure that we have proper funding for Northampton, um, especially for the schools and everything else, and we don't want to have a deficit or whatnot because then that would, you know, that could lead to less funding for something, and I feel like we already, have, we've done a very good job in Northampton of making sure that we are properly funding the important programs throughout the city, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cody. Um, and now we go to Myla uh, Kabit Zinn. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Myla Kabat Zinn, and I live at 32 Ward Avenue. Um, I'm here. I, I just found out about the meeting tonight, and um, so I would like to support the Safe Cities Ordinance, and I'm mainly here really to support ordinance requiring the use of organic pest management uh, in municipal places where children play. Uh, from, I'm, rel I'm relatively new to Northampton a couple of years, and before that I was in Lexington, Mass. for many years and worked on pesticide reduction in the schools in Lexington. And I would really like to encourage you to support this because um, it's a very important first step. Children are the most vulnerable vulnerable populations to pesticides, to the harmful effects of pesticides. A lot of pesticides that are used are neurotoxins. And so uh, it's very important that we, you know, there's some things we can't control. This is something we can control. There's really absolutely no excuse in this day and age for a town as um, enlightened and as progressive and as uh, smart as Northampton to be doing the same old, same old, we really need to change our practices. So I'm very happy that the, uh, that there was this investigation of the uses of pesticides in the city, and I hope that um, I really hope this will continue with um, whatever you can do to keep that uh, overview of what's going on and what you can do to continue to actually do more than even what's in this particular ordinance. So thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so now. Is Karen Foster here? We have a counselor elect now. Oh, yes, Past, you present, know me, and I'll future. I'll state my name for the record. I'm Please. Karen Foster. I live at 155 Grove Street. There's so much on the agenda tonight, um, but I just wanted to also add my voice in support of the act to reduce pesticides where children play. Um, I learned a lot from the select committee's report from what was happening, and I know people have good intentions. Um, but I think codifying that so that we're not relying on the good intentions of, the, of any one person um, to choose when they're using pesticides, but to make sure that we're codifying the best practices, and in particular where children play. We know that their metabolic rates are higher, they're close to the ground, they're running around. Um, you know, I think this is a great first step. I know there were compromises to the ordinance, um, but I think we should start here and then look towards strengthening in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen uh, LeBlanc. Uh, pass. Okay. Seeing passes. Uh, Jeff Napolitano. Hi, I'm Jeff Napolitano. I uh, live at 26 Burke's Pit Road, and I'm from the Resistance Center for Peace and Justice. That feels like a little bit of deja vu, but. Um, I'm here in support of the Safe City Ordinance. I won't um, repeat the reasons that others have so eloquently stated for why um, this should pass. Um, I just wanted to express my thanks to the counselors who worked on this, Councilor Dwight and Councilor Klein. Um, and Jean-Louise, she's not here, yes. Um, 
I've stated before, and I'll just state one more time, that this uh, ordinance means that Northampton is join, going to join the other communities um, that have passed this piece of work um, that we and the Resistance Center and the Immigrant Protection Project have passed uh, in the Valley, um, and also that this is a baseline uh, municipal position of sort of basic humanity for the people in our city. Um, but it is a substantial provision. Um, it may not be the sexiest piece of municipal legislation, but its impact is real, um, and it will stand in stark contrast to the communities that have chosen to look the other way um, at the victimization of their, at, of their neighbors. Um, so thank you, and um, go unanimous vote. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we have Javier, and then, honest to God, I just, it's the, I can't read the last name, I'm sorry. So you can, you can tell us yourself, introduce yourself, and the floor is all yours. Uh, Javier Luengo Garrido from the ACLU, 27 Northern Avenue, Northampton. Uh, hold on, I wrote something, I guess. Uh, you know, I'm, first I, I want to say thank you. Uh, thanks for trying to put to, in the last meeting, even I was not here, I was the video for making the implicit explicit. Uh, Thanks to Lisa Klein, thanks Bill uh, for having uh, the courage to go ahead with this. Um, you know, being a brown person, uh, having an accent, uh, not being born a US citizen, I sort of know what's going on outside when, when I get stopped by a poli uh, police officer or state trooper, or even if ICE questions me on the street. I know that this is this is a relevant piece of legislation, um, and I, I, I'm thank you to you for considering. I'm thank I'm thankful to Narkowitz, uh, Narkowitz for taking a look to it. Uh, but I also want to set the record straight. Without the work of Jeff Napolitano and the resistance, and I want to be really emphatic with this: this would not be possible at all. Many times. Uh, Organizations that they deserve the credit of the amazing work that they are doing, they are not getting it. Here, I want to say thank you to Jeff Napolitano. Thank you for Springfield, for the work that the resistance that did in Springfield, uh, the work that they did in East Hampton in Greenfield, for the work that they are doing in Northampton. And if there is anything that I can say of Jeff Napolitano and his, his leadership, is that we have what we have right now in Western Mass. Thanks to the Resistance Center and thanks to Jeff Napolitano. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. <coughs> oh, we have a second sheet. <coughs> Sharon Moulton is the last. So, Sharon Moulton. <coughs> Welcome. Frequent flyer. Yes. Always, always glad to see you. Yes. I was Um, I'm, my name is Sharon Moulton. I live at 48 Evergreen Road, number 313. And I want to start by thanking you for turning the, um, the, the, the mayor's executive order into an ordinance. I was really involved with that back to when you two first got elected. It, um, and I'm glad that it's now becoming law. I just found out tonight about the override, but I'm always willing to pay more to do the things that need to be done. Um, I want to especially thank the council for having the select committee on the pesticide reduction. I, you know when you greet me, I s enjoy spending time being the general public and paying attention to important things in the city, and I have to say that attending one of their uh, later meetings was one of the best experiences I've had. The, the care that they took, the amount of research, and then they were talking over what does this mean and where are we going. I was really honored to be there, and I'm really hoping that it will turn into a piece of legislation. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, the final name I have is Denise Lello. Okay. And you pass as well? Okay. 
And so, is there anyone who has not signed up who would like to speak? Uh, so Dr. Nathan was first, and then we'll go there afterwards. Hi, Marty Nathan, 24 Massasoit Street. Thanks for doing all these things tonight. Very briefly, yes, pass, to, pass the safe pesticide um, ordinance. Yes, let's do an override if we need it. But I wanted to speak to the issue of uh, the Safe Communities Ordinance because I take care of undocumented workers in Springfield. I know that's not Northampton, but I know that their probably main health issue is anxiety over the possibility of being separated for the rest of their lives from their kids through deportation. Um, this is a public health issue. These are our neighbors. We must treat them with respect and decrease that anxiety. They do the work that serves us, and they are our friends and should be a respected part of our society and not face the fear that they fe face every day. Thanks for passing it unanimously. Thank you. So we had, we had doctor number two over here, I believe. Yes. We Thanks, Wayne. You've gotten a lot of implicit praise tonight. So. Yes, I'm happy to hear that. Um, my name is Kate Simmons. I served on the Pesticide Reduction Committee, Select Committee. And I urge you all to check it out on the Northampton website. The report that we submitted at the end is there in full and especially to go to Appendix 3, I believe it is, a table which is, if you will, an inventory of all the pesticides in use by the city of Northampton. And for that reason, I'm behind Elisa Klein's ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And th thanks again for your service on that select committee. My pleasure. So I see Alex Jarrett put his hand up, Mr. Jarrett. Councilor-elect Jarrett, welcome. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about the override tonight. I don't yet know all the details of it, but I know enough of the budget to know that it is needed and I am in support of it. I expect the mayor will detail the reasons and want, I would like to hear about how the marijuana money and the recently passed state education bill, why that is not enough. Um, but, and you know, we all think know the, the basic reason is the inflation rate is greater than uh, two and a half percent over time. So periodically, we do need to uh, increase, have an increase. Then there are many things we'll need to pay for um, with, with regards to climate change uh, in the coming years, for sure. Um, but my concern is about the inequality of it. The property values, property values are not necessarily related to the ability to pay. And um, people with lower incomes, uh, homeowners already get the maximum relief that the state allows us to give. Um, renters, um, there's, you know, those paying market rate, maybe they won't, maybe the property owners will have to absorb that, but those who are paying below market rate, um, those are the naturally affordable units that we are, where we have landlords who are, are, have owned for a while, they don't see the need to raise rents just to raise them. And, um, but they'll have to pass along those costs. And so the question is sort of is what to do about it, and it's going to take collaboration because we can't, we don't have the authority to do m much on our own. The state uh, restricts us. So we, we need to work with our state legislators. Um, we need to keep working for a more progressive income tax and a different way of, of funding. Uh, we should look at the possibility of home rule petitions to the state to allow us to give more relief based on income or to tax very expensive, say, single family properties at a higher rate. Um, we're looking at renters, could there be a pass through relief or refund in some way? I don't know the answers to it, but I think we have an obligation uh, as we're putting this on the ballot and um, hopefully passing it to be addressing the needs of those uh, who are, you know, don't have, who can't afford it, because there are many here in this town who can't afford it, 
but the people who can't uh, shouldn't have to um, fund this override. Thanks. Thank you very much for those comments. So, anyone else? Would anyone else like to speak on any subject? No? Okay. So, hearing none, we're going to convene the council, and I will ask for a roll call, please. Councilor Bidwell. Here. Present. Here. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor O'Donnell. Here. Councillor Sherrod. Okay, so we have a quorum and we are <coughs> convened. Let's see, so preview of, of coming attractions with the uh, agenda. We have a lot of important things on the agenda. What I'm thinking, councillors, as we go through the hearings, um, we'll do whatever quick announcements we have to do. We'll do the charter review presentation and discussion, but then maybe go directly back to the mayor's administrative order just to keep those things as close together as possible since the hearing is on the administrative order. Um, and then maybe we can move up pesticide at some point because it sounds like there's interest, people have attended for that as well. Safe city. Yeah. And we could do the second reading on safe city. So, okay. So that is my game plan. Um, but first, let's do the hearings. First is an announcement of a public hearing. This is 19158 National Grid Verizon New England Poll Petition for Hatfield Street, Petition 1504741. In accordance with the provisions of Section 22, Chapter 166 of the General Laws, a public hearing will be held on Thursday, December 19th, 2019 at 705 here in the City Council Chambers, 212 Main Street, Northampton. On the petition of National Grid Verizon New England to erect poles and wires upon, along, under, or across one or more public ways. Um, and this is for Hatfield Street. So that's next time. Now is an actual public hearing. This is in accordance with Section 6.1 of the Northampton City Charter. The City Council uh, will hold uh, right now a public hearing to consider proposed amendments to the City of Northampton Administrative Code. Uh, the scope of the proposal is as follows. Uh, changes to the following sections. Part 1, Administrative Organization. This includes 201, Office of the Mayor, 207, Office of Planning and Sustainability, 403, Senior Services, and 601, Department of Public Works. It includes uh, Part 2, Multiple Member Appointive Organization. Uh, 109, Multiple Member Body Internal Organizations, 5.0, Assessors, Board of. Uh, 11, Energy and Sustainability Commission. 14, Housing Partnership. And 24, Transportation and Parking Commission. So at this time, I would entertain a motion to open the hearing. To open the public hearing. Second. Okay. <coughs> um, all those in favor of opening the public hearing, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The hearing is open. I think it's most appropriate to begin by inviting the mayor, if he wants to give an introduction for his proposals, since he's bringing them to the council. Thank you, good evening, councilors and uh, members of the public. Um, and thank you for holding this hearing uh, in accordance with the charter. Some of you know, and particularly the members of the Charter uh, Review Committee that are here tonight, uh, this is the way under our new charter that um, the organization of uh, city agencies is carried out. Um, the mayor submits from time to time um, administrative orders. Um, obviously, when we first passed the charter, uh, one of our first tasks was to put everything into one mega administrative code. It took us about a year to do that. The charter allowed us that time um, to really scattered all throughout the rest of our city documents, including the charter, including the ordinances. And then I've come back to you periodically with um, changes to it. Um, sometimes they're after changes that occur as part of budgetary uh, changes that go through the council. Um, and other times they are related to uh, staffing changes. Um, and then sometimes they're just changes to the functions of various committees or commissions, things like that. So. Um, these are kind of a, uh, a mixture of all those kinds of things. And um, as required by the charter, I have provided you with a detailed um, message uh, that accompanied the order, um, explaining the rationale uh, for the changes um, and sort of broken them up into sort of four, uh, four main parts, I believe, in the, um, in the, or three main parts. Um, the first one is really effectuating some um, uh, changes within 
um, some staff changes that we've had over, uh, either, either have had or will have at the end of the year. Um, and that is uh, two staffers uh, uh, that originally started in the Office of Planning and Sustainability, then were moved to a separate department, then uh, through budgetary changes were moved into my office, um, and now due to the subsequent retirement of those two has provided us with an opportunity to kind of relook at that structure um, and interesting we're sort of completing the circle and putting them back into the Office of Planning and Sustainability um, and uh, and most notably as part of that um, we are going to f uh, follow through on a recommendation that's come to us from um, the Disability Committee uh, which is to really take the role of the ADA coordinator out of the direct uh, senior center director um, and find a more appropriate place for it. So as part of it, um, the ADA um, coordination responsibility would move into the um, uh, Office of Planning and Sustainability um, under the aegis of a new um, community development planner um, who, would, um, um, who would be covering both housing, homelessness, as well as um, disability issues. And they would begin working with the disability uh, committee um, and then the other staffer, um, we'd actually made a change in the budget this year, but the other staffer um, who was primarily focused on just CDBG grants management would do um, all grants management for the Office of Planning and State Sustainability, including CDBG, including CPA, um, and including all the other myriad of grants that the Office of Planning and Sustainability are so um, adept at securing and administering. Um, and so that's really the, that's sort of the first uh, piece of the change. Um, the second one um, is really catching up with what we did in the FY 2020 uh, budget. Um, as those, those of you uh, know, we made some changes um, organizationally that uh, Director Lascalia recommended and I supported um, to create a standalone uh, division of forestry parks and cemeteries. Um, and so, the, the administrative code currently reflects the old uh, divisions and we wanted to update that to reflect this change um, in the division. So it's really um, some housekeeping after the fact. Um, and, then the, um, and then there's revisions to four multiple member bodies, um, the Board of Assessors, the Housing Partnership, uh, the Energy and Sustainability Commission, and the Transportation and Parking Commission. Um, the, uh, the sort of the key highlights of that one. Um, we currently have a board of assessors um, that's uh, ostensibly a three member board, um, but actually the principal assessor who's a staff member is one of the members of the board. Um, that's, a, uh, that's been a model that's, um, uh, well, I should say that in many towns there is no staff member and the board of assessors are all volunteers and they are the assessors for the, for the, for the town. Um, and so it's sort of a hybrid of that model that came out of um, sort of a, an, another time. So what we're recommending and what the principal assessor supports is that we actually just make that a three member board, that's three residents, um, and then the principal assessor obviously maintains uh, her role as the principal assessor doing the day-to-day -day work. Um, and there are certain matters that the principal assessor has to bring to the board of assessors um, to get recommendations on things like abatements um, and things like that. So it just, I think it fits in more with our current structure of government um, to have the professional staff going to the uh, advisory board or the board that's making these decisions. So it's a keeping the same size, but just the composition. The other, the other um, problem with it, the way it's currently structured is that it would require for the future that any assessor would need to be a city resident in order to serve on the board of assessors. So it also just for succession planning uh, makes sense from that perspective. Um, the um, other change that's in here is actually something that's um, coming as a recommendation uh, from the uh, outgoing um, housing uh, planner, Peg Keller, and that is um, seeking uh, to reduce the size of the housing partnership, um, which is currently one of our largest uh, boards at 15 members, uh, seeking to reduce that to 11 members. Um, uh, <coughs> they typically had um, vacancies as well as difficulties um, achieving a quorum at, at some points. Um, so that was a recommendation to bring it in line with other similar size committees. Um, and then the final um, piece relates to uh, two of our 
um, committees, uh, transportation and parking, and the Energy and Sustainability Commission, which are sort of um, unlike all of many of our other uh, boards and committees in that they are multi-agency in terms of having executive branch employees. Um, so you have the directors of five agencies that actually are members of this um, body, and then you have some citizen members, and then you have um, elected officials. Um, originally, when it was first created as part of the code, um, it was explicitly city councilors, and um, I actually was one of those members who served for many years. Some of you here have served for many years. When we made the charter change, one of the things that we had to understand is that, again, um, because of the separation of powers, I can't actually compel a counselor to serve on a committee. Only the council can make its committees and make appointments. So we changed that language to elected officials. Um, it's uh, been to typically been city councilors who've served on it, but I can't mandate that, the city, that a city councilor serve on an executive branch committee. So that's why we changed that language a few years ago. Um, but there has been um, still some continued confusion about the bodies um, in terms of is it an executive branch committee, is it a legislative branch committee. Um, and that happened when I was on, the, uh, on, on one and both of those committees as well as it's continued uh, to this point. So we are making some changes, just some, some membership type changes uh, that are more minor, um, such as um, codifying that the, uh, in the case of the um, Transportation and Parking Commission, um, uh, codifying, or actually swapping out a member. We currently have the Director of Central Services um, who has been serving on that, and we've had the um, Parking Enforcement uh, op, uh, Director as an advisor, um, but really we're, we want to make that person an actual member of the committee and swap them out for the central services director because they're really more engaged in the day-to-day -day work of the um, of the uh, parking system and uh, and and really I think can add more than the maintenance side which is what the um, uh, director of uh, central services adds um, to that committee so that's uh, one of the changes um, also uh, streamlining the citizen appointment um, and uh, removing the planning board appointment uh, to the TPC, um, which creates another layer of, um, uh, it's already a citizen, we already have uh, uh, planning um, department staff representation, um, but it, it also created this odd mid-cycle appointment from a planning board that was two years, and um, as planning board members changed over, and then as the elected officials changed over, it, it created some odd gaps. So just simplifying it and making all of those citizen uh, members um, and, uh, and then obviously um, maintaining uh, the two elected officials. The, um, on the Energy and Sustainability uh, Commission, the clarification is to actually make the facilities director of Smith Vocational the actual um, representative of Smith Vocational on the committee. It's always been um, that it's a, um, the superintendent um, selects someone, but really it's always been the facilities director because the idea being that um, the city has a dual facilities director for cities and schools, Mr. Pomerantz, or the director of central services, and Smithvoke is a separate facilities uh, department. So we've always wanted to have those two pieces, which are all of our city facilities um, being on that committee. So just sort of simplifying that. Um, and just uh, calling it out in, ter in terms of who should serve on it. Um, the other, the, the more significant changes is that um, I am asking that there be um, ex officio chairs of these two committees. Um, and in that case, in the case of the Transportation and Parking Commission, um, asking that the uh, uh, Director of Public Works serve as the chair and the um, uh, police chief serve as the vice chair. Um, they're the two um, department heads who do bring most of the um, expertise and work and actually go back and um, they take policy, they take recommendations, and they go back and do uh, much of the work, um, and they bring much of the um, information forward to the commission. Um, so having them serve in that role, and again, as a um, these are multi-member bodies that are convened 
by a chair or a vice chair, um, but they operate as a multi-member body. The chair is convening the meeting and chairing the meeting. Um, on the Energy and Sustainability uh, Commission, um, similarly, I would ask, uh, I'm, I'm recommending that the uh, Director of Planning and Sustainability serve as chair and the Director of Central Services uh, serve as vice chair um, for the very same reasons. And in both cases, we have staff advisors to the committee, um, the Energy and Sustainability Officer, who's been the longtime staff advisor to the um, to the Energy and Sustainability Commission, we actually call it out there and put it in there um, because they've really, uh, Chris has really been the person who has um, managed the day-to-day -day ongoing operations of that commission and put together agendas and actually run the meetings, frankly, if you've ever been to one of the meetings. So, um, and then similarly on the TPC side, um, um, obviously removing the parking, uh, uh, enforcement director as an advisor since they're now on the commission and and maintaining the fact that the city's um, uh, traffic engineer continues to be uh, the consultant or the the staff technical staffer to the committee so those are all of the changes um, in total that I'm recommending and um, and again I've given you uh, rationale within this uh, document for why I believe that um, they are they will make our city agencies function more efficiently and I'm happy to answer questions after you have the rest of your public hearing or questions now yeah. whatever you prefer yeah, I appreciate that I think my preference is let's hear from the public okay. and then come back to you and members of the council Excellent. but great overview thank you uh, mr. mayor so um, this is like public comment um, meets Lord of the Flies you know there are fewer rules um, but it's up to you to use your own judgment about how long uh, you wish to communicate, being mindful that we want as many people to express themselves as possible. So there's no sign up. So uh, by show of hands, who, is there any member of the public who'd like to speak for, against, or neutral, or anything about this topic? Yes, sir, you first in the red coat, and then I'll go back. If you give your name and address the record, the floor is yours. Sure, my name is Gordon Meadows. I live at 239 Bridge Street. Uh, I'm a third generation resident of this town. My grandfather was the chief of surgery. and My mother grew up on the same street that I live on now. Uh, I'm a member of the Northampton Energy and Sustainability Commission, and I want to speak to the uh, restructuring recommended by the mayor. Uh, I am a subject matter expert who volunteered to be on that commission and I feel so fortunate to be able to do that work and I have two other commission <coughs> members who are also volunteer members of the community that are incredible subject matter experts. One is a professor at UMass uh, who teaches in building science and technology. The reason that I <coughs> wanted to get up and speak today is in support of maintaining the autonomy of that commission. I think that it's incredibly important that we not have a person assigned as our chair whose workload will be directly affected by the recommendations that we are making as a <coughs> commission. And I think that that separation of power is incredibly important because the energy revolution that we are going to experience over the next 30 years is going to be extraordinary and require a great deal of work to be done by municipalities like ours. I think that it is essential that we retain our autonomy and be allowed to continue to elect our own <coughs> chairperson who can steer our work. It is also my hope that we can coordinate very closely with the director of the planning department. It will be essential that we can make sure that we are heard as a commission and that the city is following through to make us a sustainable community, which is all of our goal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who's next? We had Ms. Lombard next, I believe. Hi, I'm Lily Lombard. I would like to speak um, in uh, opposition of the, the mayor's request to um, assign specific chairs to the, both the Transportation Parking Commission and the Energy and Sustainability Commission. I happen to be a chair. 
of a city commission. I have the honor to. Um, it is not a multi-departmental um, body the way the, these are, so I understand the distinction. However, I, um, I'm elected by my peers, and I hold myself to a high standard that they also hold me to. And I think it makes us um, more effective um, and, and more considered in our work. And, and, and it makes the chair more, um, just more on her toes. Um, I fully respect the, the mayor and his excellent administration. And I, I think uh, all of the other recommendations that he, he, he is proposing are sound. Um, and uh, I think this one is just the case of maybe a, uh, using a, a bazooka to kill an ant. I, I think it's um, more power than it is required for to, to, um, to solve this problem. I don't know if, I don't know really, uh, maybe the mayor can speak to what is at the root of this confusion. He's described confusion. I would like to understand that more. But regardless, if, it, if it's city councilors, if it's a confusion of <coughs> city councilors overstepping their legislative authority into an executive area, then that feels like there, there might be a narrow solution to that. But regardless, these are advisory committees. Um, they, they have no authority other than to provide um, counsel. And so um, it seems to me like and also that a chair really can never act unilaterally independent of the decision, the will of the entire commission. So I, I, I don't see how the, whoever the chair is would have an impact on the, um, the executive side of government being able to carry out its work. So um, there are, the, the, the point that Gordon made, which is that we have hard, hard work ahead of us. We have 10 years to make dramatic reductions in our global uh, greenhouse emissions in order to avert catastrophic climate change. This is going to be uncomfortable times, folks. There's no way around it. And we're all going to have to be called upon to work so much harder. And that means that we, we want the advisory commissions that we, um, that we uh, appoint and um, uh, have do our work, we want them to be, to be doing the hard work, asking the very hard questions, and proposing really um, paradigm-shifting proposals that a, a department chair may not fully, you know, be fully excited about or um, have the means or the time or the expertise to, to fully examine. So we, we really need to engage our commissions like we never have before. And those commissions need to reach out to other members of the public and, and um, excitedly engage their involvement. So <coughs> what I'm saying is we are um, entering really unprecedented times. And we need our commissions to be as nimble, as bold, as visionary, and as proactive as they can be. And to me, that means having the freedom to choose their own leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, who else? Yes, Ms. Franks. The counselor from Ward 8 at this point. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even have to. Uh, Where is that, by the way? Campaign. Uh, it's the best way to I do also, it. I uh, would like to speak to the uh, proposed change to the Energy and Sustainability Commission. For the last several years, I've uh, attended most of um, the, the meetings of that commission, and I'm, uh, and I'm puzzled about the structural clarification um, that um, is alluded to and the confusion that is alluded to um, in the rationale for a change, because it's always made very clear at all the commission meetings other settings where that I've been in with Chris Mason, that the Energy and Sustainability Commission is serves in an advisory role to the mayor, and it's very clear, and there's you know there's no confusion, and I haven't seen any city councilors who are on the commission overstepping their roles or, or um, so I'm so I'm puzzled about that, and my my understanding is the reason to have um, residents of Northampton on these multi body commissions 
is to benefit from their expertise, from their enthusiasm, from their um, independent ideas, because they're not city employees and they're not elected, so they can, in fact, feel free to provide their ideas. And then they, there can be a free exchange of ideas and, and, a, and, and they can freely debate those ideas. And, um, but to have a preordained chair uh, changes, changes things especially if it's a head of a city department because that gives the appearance of then the commission being an arm of that department rather than an independent body that's actually having a free exchange of ideas. And so, uh, so I see that as a detriment and um, the downside of that would be, that I think it would be, um, it would be a, a discouragement to residents who might be considering putting themselves forward to be on this commission or or the other commission, I have never been to the, the uh, Transportation and Parking Commission meeting, so I can't speak to that. But uh, I would think that it would be, a, um, that it would discourage people from volunteering, uh, putting themselves forward to be considered for, to be on a commission, if they thought that in fact that the commission was just gonna be doing the bidding of a particular department of the city. Um, so, so that in itself, to me, is a reason to not preordain um, a department head as the chair of, this, um, of the Energy and Sustainability Commission. <coughs> and, um, and I think that it also does a disservice to the commission because it's basically saying to the commission that you, you're not, you, you can't govern yourself. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, tell you who your chair is going to be and I would uh, much prefer to see the, the commission elect its own chair and, and perhaps you know there's some improvement that could be had there so that the chair's responsibilities are more clearly delineated so that whoever is elected the chair knows exactly what, what they're getting into and what, what, what their obligations are. So that's my comment. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so I see Ms. Moulton's hand up. So this is the place where I've been the general public the most. I've been to just about every single meeting since 2014. And I think Adele will say that she comes because I encouraged other Climate Action Now activists to really be involved. And I feel, I'm not gonna repeat it, I feel exactly uh, um, how other people have said that that would be a terrible mistake to have appointed um, chair and, and vice chair. Um, there were a couple other things that I noticed when I read over the whole thing. And it, because of the climate emergency and, and the work that the Office of Planning and Sustainability is gonna have to do, I, I was flabbergasted to read that the office is supposed to provide administrative, clerical, and technical support for seven existing planning boards and commissions and whatever, and then s the Disability Commission is gonna be added. And I noticed that, um, that the, the Energy and Sustainability Commission wasn't listed as something that the Office of Planning and Sustainability was gonna provide anything for. So that really, and then coupled with when there were going to be the appointed chair and vice chair. Clerk was pa was crossed out. So if it, you know, I know that we have a sort of volunteer person who's been serving as the clerk, but you can't, you know, it. If it's clear that always, it, well, I I just wondered about that. If and um, I don't. That's fine. yeah. Fair enough. Interesting. Thank you. Um, so who else? We have Dr. Marty Nathan again. Boring. You spice um, it up this time. <laughs> What'd you say, Ryan? Well, you said boring, and I said you could spice it up in okay, some creative I'll, way. Yeah. Let's see what I don't I think do. it's boring when you Actually, talk. Actually, I'm not going to spice it up. I'm, I'm going to 
say that I support what was just said, but I think that I, I really want to emphasize this issue of climate emergency and crisis and, and needing to get everybody on board and needing new I ideas and energy. And I know that the last Energy and Sustainability Commission meeting really illustrated that in which the uh, the planning department had the, the reliability and, and regeneration plan already, but the volunteer members of the commission brought into question the, uh, the force of it, to say bluntly, and really shook it up. And I think that that was a wonderful example of why it's, it really helps to have this led by people who are absolutely <laughs> dedicated just to that, and this is not just one more piece of work that, in and, and, and a day that's way too long already, okay? I, I think that we need that. We c need that kind of energy and thoughtfulness and creativity and that we have in this community, and we should pull it in and support the city as it goes forward, being a leader in the struggle for a decent and sustainable climate. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, good. Anyone else from the public like to talk at this time? Sure. Come on up. Alex Jarrett. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm a member of the Housing Partnership, and we were part of request to lower our membership because of difficulty in achieving a quorum. Um, so I'm definitely in favor of that section. Um, I do get concerned about any piece where there's a reduction in democracy, um, where <coughs> something is prescribed rather than um, where the, the members of the multiple member bodies get to make their uh, vote, <coughs> to vote in that. Um, so I'm in favor of retaining the autonomy of those bodies um, and have them elect their chairs and vice chairs. And thinking longer term, uh, thinking about flexibility and you know, ne not necessarily about the pr particular people in charge now, but as, as things change, um, ha giving those bodies the flexibility to make those the choices um, without having to change this order again. Thanks. Anyone else? Um, this will be a little free flowing, so I want to maybe go to the council. You can ask some questions. Um, if it sparks other thoughts among the public, that's okay. We can come back to the public. All right. So <coughs> we'll start with Councilor Carney. Thank you. Uh, to the mayor, please, through the chair. Yep. The Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, if you want to be available for questions or. Just a clarification. Sure. Um, those members you described as ex officio, so they wouldn't actually be present and chairing those meetings? Oh, no, they would. I, I mean, I, people often confuse what ex officio means. Um, I'm actually the chair of the school committee ex officio. doesn't mean I'm not a member of the committee. It just means by virtue of my office. Okay. That's what ex officio means. So I was, it's not a particular planning director or a particular, it just means that by, they're, they're the the planning and sustainability director, or the, um, or whoever the you know police chief is at that time. Okay. So and I just to contrast, I'm just thinking of in the previous administration and previous charter, mm -hmm. um, we had a finance committee that was, I don't think by council rules, but maybe administrative order, um, chaired by the mayor, mm -hmm. and um, also the president of the city council was. Per, per was order, per was per, order. Or yeah, was per charter, okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, these are things that either appear in the charter or we adopt an administrative order. Yeah, the finance uh, uh, was actually in the original charter. Um, the mayor chaired this body, chaired the finance committee, and um, actually for a time made all the appointments to all the city council committees, which is why we um, decided to create the, the separation of powers, that's correct. Okay, so we're still kind of catching up to our very last um, charter change, even yes. though we're in the process of examining our charter now. Mm -hmm. too. Okay. Yeah. Just um, and if I could, overview. I would remind you, Councillor, you may not remember it at this point, but um, uh, when we were first-term councillors together back in 
2005. A long time ago. Uh, or actually, we weren't first term counselors, but as a counselor, I was very much um, adamant about the separation of powers. As a counselor, I was, not just as mayor, um, and, um, and actually amended Chapter 22, which was then our, our ordinance related to um, uh, boards and committees to remove counselors from all the boards and committees because we had boards we had counselors that were serving on multi-member boards including the board of public works um i'm sorry to say it you were on the housing authority yes he was on the um central business architecture right. committee um and it was creating some odd situations around um you know the role of counselors as legislators and the role of counselors serving on multi-member bodies. Yes, and um, when we adopted that, I was required to step off yes, the so uh, Housing Authority I, I as made Councilor Dostal yeah, on the Board of Public Works. Was, and Councilor Reckman had to resign as well. So I was not necessarily popular then, but I really felt strongly, even as a Ward 4 counselor, that there needs to be a clear separation of powers um, among the legislative and the executive branch, and that counselors are elected and um, and serve a really important role independently, um, and we've tried to integrate them onto two of these executive level committee, executive branch committees. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it still has created perception issues um, over time in terms of are they there as a counselor or are they there as a member of a multi-member body? I do the same thing as the as the school committee chair because I'm the mayor everywhere else. On the school committee, I'm one of ten members who chairs the body, and I have no none of my mayor powers transfer over there. But it does create some odd perceptions. And but weren't you, as a private citizen prior to election, chair of transportation I and parking? Been, I had been the um, citizen chair as well. Um, I think I was the only citizen chair um, ever. And um, then it's been more of it's kind mostly of been counselors. Practice um, after that. Yeah, it's it, mostly been counselors. Um, me then. Councillor yeah. Adams and um, and we've had a series of and I do think that has created some of the issues around people's perception of the committee and chairs are often viewed every counselor sends them all their traffic woes um, because they think that they can fix them as chair um, I have um, former chief of staff the town manager of Long Meadow who was the longtime clerk to the council who found herself taking minutes for transportation and parking commission meetings as the council clerk because uh, it was like it just felt like and so again there's been this blurring of um, lines so mostly I was focused on the TPC model um, but then I felt that because energy and sustainability and TPC energy and sustainability was mo modeled directly after TPC I mean it's the same it was modeled after uh, TPC it was created years after and so um, I felt like if I'm going to make this recommendation for TPC, I need to be consistent with energy and sustainability. Um, and again, I think I, I appreciate what the folks have said earlier, what um, uh, what, what Lily said, um, and and I especially appreciate the fact that this this is an advisory body, and everybody um, makes a contribution. The chair chairs the meeting, um, and again, um, the reason why people have taken turns taking minutes on the <coughs> Energy and Sustainability Commission since its existence is because the staffer's been chairing the meeting. Um, and, and so that's what's been happening effectively. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my rationale there. Actually, so I saw a while ago Councilor Klein's hand go up and then we'll go to Councilor Dwight. I have a bunch of questions and then I actually have some concerns. Sure. Um, I'm interested, I just want to follow up the number in the housing partnership what was the original rationale for 15 members and now we're lowering it I'm just I'm concerned about kind of um, if the rationale was in fact to have more voices at the table to have a wider breadth of opinion sitting on something that's very relevant to our community um, you know are we are we doing a disservice to ourselves so I'm just curious about what the original rationale was and what um, the current rationale was not part of the original creation of it this was mm -hmm. something that predated my time in city government it wasn't something that I when I created the administrative code I basically transferred what was already in in chapter 22 of the ordinance and just moved it over um, and at that point we just 
that was much of what we did was we sort of moved things that were in the ordinances into the code. Um, this again, and you heard um, you know from a commissioner uh, as well as this came. This really came from Peg Keller, um, feeling like it's been challenging for her to get a quorum at a board that at that large and and managing a board that large and so she really felt like 11 would still be a large board and you could still get a diverse number of voices um, at the table um, as well as just the many stakeholders that they work with and, and have before them all the time so I this is really one that was recommended to me by Peg Keller who's we all know is retiring and she's been working with the housing partnership now for 25 30 years um, and so this is really her her expert recommendation that I'm just putting forward. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to ask, you know, you're talking about um, how we're striving for consistency. So we're trying to kind of create each commission. For these two boards. With a yeah. similar yeah. structure. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, to me, a glaring inconsistency in that the TPC is swapping out the director of central services, putting in the parking I'm not sure what her title is, parking director, Nancy, yeah. um, as, as a member. But then on the Sustainability Commission and the, um, the Sustainability Commission and the TPC, both the traffic engineer and the, the, off the sustainability officer, who are the content people, the same way that Nancy essentially is the content person in terms of parking, are um, are not actually members; they're advisors. So I'm confused about the advisor versus um, membership role okay. because that seems to be an inconsistency between those three folks, those okay. th three roles. So currently, um, uh, currently, uh, Nancy Forrestall, who's the Parking Enforcement Director, she uh, works in the cl Treasure Collector's Office, um, and our city's traffic engineer are the two kind of technical advisors to the committee. Um, uh, the director of central services um, serves as a full voting member. And he's really there because you may remember, I think it was actually before your time in the council, but we kind of bifurcated parking and we put enforcement in the treasurer collector's office. Wait, and so am I misunderstanding though that it's, you're taking the director of central services off out and yes. putting Nancy in as a as member. A full right. member. So still a sub, still a, de a department level person. Right. So um, that's the inconsistency that I'm talking about. That Nancy's going to be a member, but the the traffic engineer is not, well, and the we also have sustainability the officer is not okay. when they're the content experts. Well, so the the challenge there is that you have the um, the traffic engineer is works for the Department of Public Works director and is a subordinate of the DPW director, and the DPW director is on the commission. Um, and so you already have the DPW represented there. Um, and the same thing with central services. You have the director of central services who Chris Mason uh, reports to. It's one, he's one of um, David's deputies um, that work on various things. He's the energy and sustainability officer. He's got a facilities person. He's got a schools person. Um, but David really brings the overall picture for the buildings uh, and for facilities. So um, it didn't make sense to have two members of the same body on there um, and uh, from the same department or to put a subordinate in a, in a role over their, their director, uh, frankly. So um, Chris has um, all, always, it's never been denoted in there, but he is the staffer to this and he has staffed it and he's been the, the technical staffer to the committee and I just wanted to kind of co codify that. So I'm not, it's not like I'm taking him off um, I'm really just trying to recognize him th for the first time because it wasn't really called out before. Um, uh, to, um, to the point that was the concern earlier about why isn't it part of planning and sustainability because it's still staying with central services and with, um, with um, the, uh, the, the um, Chris Mason in terms of the staff, the staffer to the committee. Um, that's sort of, so that's not really changing. I'm just kind of calling it out for the first time. So. Okay, yep. um, thank you. So I guess the, that does kind of bring up the question for me though of you know, where the expertise lies and who um, is appointed as a member and who isn't. And, and I think that there's some inconsistencies in that in terms of what 
the people that are the advisors are, are able to bring um, without their membership, um, it just, to me, there's an inconsistency. I do understand that you're saying that Nancy is stepping in because um, uh, the director of central services is being pulled out, but I'm kind of curious why that isn't happening with those other roles that are so content expertise heavy. So again, I mean, I guess the, the only way I could um, compare the two is that you know Nancy doesn't work for David. Nancy is in a completely separate department, a department that's focused on parking enforcement and parking, you know, <laughs> and David is completely focused on maintenance. There and so they're kind of bifurcated, um, and they've both been contributing. But I just I, we fe it feels like um, to me that Nancy um, her stuff really impacts when you're bringing forward ordinances about two hour parking or eight hour parking or whatever it is people are on the street and actually see like how this plays out and they know what's actually happening and what the issues are and who's parking too close to crosswalks I mean, and so it just feels like she brings more to this than the parking maintenance side which is you know taking care of our parking so that's really what I'm doing there yeah, I have no question about so it, so Nancy's I, I just don't membership think it's analogous yeah. to David and Chris I, I, it's just it's okay. a different thing I'm actually mm -hmm. just acknowledging Chris for the first time okay. um, and uh, and taking Nancy from the advisor role and making her a full member, and I'm using their names just because it's a short name. <laughs> yes, the exactly. Um, that's all. Yep. Um, so the concerns I have the the um, ex officio chairs who are being named, you know, odd um, infinitum at this point. You know, whoever is in those roles is going to chair During these my things. During administration, at least, obviously, another a future oh, mayor has yes. the right to reorganize. Um, so it, it does concern me, and I want to echo um, some of what we heard during the comments, um, that citizens won't have, resident members won't have the ability to step up as chair. I think that, um, you know, I know I'm not, I'm comparing apples and oranges here a little. I want to acknowledge that, but, you know, the, the Select Committee on Pesticide Reduction, for in instance, which is a city council committee, but we... Um, you know, there were two counselors that were going to be part of it, but we wanted it to be an open process of deciding who would chair it. And we voted as a body, and two resident members were the chair and vice chair, and did an extraordinary job, and brought so much knowledge and so much energy and so much ability to kind of organize the, the process. And so that that's one example. The Tree Commission is another. We have. Um, Lily Lombard, who is the, the chair of the Tree Commission, she does an extraordinary job, and she acts as a liaison in a way, I think, that sometimes um, staff members can't. She acts as a liaison to the community and brings in community voices in a very unique way. And, um, and I think we're, we're really missing that opportunity, especially in light of the things that people brought up that we're you know, going into a major climate crisis right now. We need that level of energy. We need that level of community engagement and support. And there is a way in which when we engage citizen members in much more robust ways, I think we're pulling the community in in a very democratic way, in a very powerful way. And I think that having city staff who are you know, juggling a thousand um, different kinds of balls for the city, um, chairing these things, it just doesn't, it doesn't have the same ability, I think, to engage the public in processes. So that's a concern that I have. Um, in terms can I, of this, can I respond to just one sure. I, just, I guess the only thing I would say is, and again, uh, the Shade Tree Commission, um, which was created under one of my previous administrative orders, you know, that's an all citizen commission. There are no staff members on that. So it's not, there can only be a citizen chair of that committee. So it's not that- Mr. Uh, Parcelletti's on it. No, he's not. He's not a member of the commission. Okay. He's the tree warden, and he is the, he's not a voting member of the tree commission. Um, they advise the tree, the tree warden. So that's sort of the role that they play. Um, so he's not a voting member. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't think that changes, though, the conceptual piece around having citizens as chairs and vice chairs in those roles so that they can um, act in a leadership role for the city. Um, and I, I just wanted to make a, a comment about the, um, the kind of separation issues that you talked about, the, the executive branch and uh, the legislative branch. I think 
I find that it brings incredible um, richness to committees and commissions that have counselors on them, the, the mayoral commissions that have counselors on them. Um, I acted for one term as the liaison. I wasn't a voting member to the Human Rights Commission. And um, speaking for others, I, I wouldn't say this myself, but I was told repeatedly that it brought a lot of richness to that process because there's a way in which counselors have deep knowledge. They also have connections to their constituents in a particular way that can be brought to these bodies. Um, I, I, I wouldn't have a problem with saying that counselors can't chair these commissions, but I do think it's really important that we have, that we actually, we don't take separation of powers to the point where we, we dismantle collaborative processes. I think it's a really important collaboration to have the executive branch working together as much as possible with the legislative branch. And the more that we you know, stand on this concept of separation of powers, the more I think we're in danger of doing away with a very important collaborative um, spirit and proce processes that enrich government, enrich democracy, and enrich um, citizen participation. So. Um, I just want to make sure that we're not kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater here when we're talking about separation of powers as one of the reasons that we're making particular kinds of decisions. Shall we go to Councilor White? But I, but I have a chance to just respond. Do you want to respond? One, just, oh, just, sure. No, go ahead. Just yeah, that's fine. Say, I, I appreciate that concern. I, I do think that these are very unique committees from all of our This is a body that has five um, city officials on it, five city staffers on it already by design. Um, so that's, it's a little bit different than those other commissions. And, um, and again, I'm not, I, we've said that, the, that they're collaborative bodies. Um, they are making advisory opinions and who chairs the commission um, is really the person who's uh, you know, managing the meetings, bringing forth the agenda, but the agenda discussion comes from all the members and all that expertise. So I don't, and again, in point of fact, um, it, it's what's happening now on the Energy and Sustainability Commission. It, it's what's been happening since the conception. It's been led by staff and been led by a staff person. Um, so that's, I, again, I'm part of this is trying to match uh, the facts on the ground with what's in the administrative I, order. I feel like I need to sure. respond to that too. I just, we're, I think that debating. one of, excuse well, me, point of order, we're debating as opposed to a hearing, and I think there's an opportunity for us to debate mm -hmm. when when it comes up to vote on the order. But well, let's let's define what we expect then, because we could in fact limit council debate and shift it to when the the motion comes up on the actual thing, if that's the count what the council wants to do. I also want to have some initial discussion among the council in case it sparks responses from the public. So. Why don't we meet in the middle and let's try to just mix in as many initial comments as possible because every counselor will have multiple bites at the apple. And I, I agree, I don't really want to have a, a total back and forth point by point, but I also don't want to limit people's ability to make those points. So counselors can police themselves maybe. Uh, so would the counselor for Ward 7 yield to the counselor at large? And yes, I will. <laughs> um, these mayoral commissions exist by name and understanding and definition as serving at the pleasure of the executive at the time. So in that respect, what do these committees, and, and particularly the two that seem to come up for the most, the, the, the thrust of most of our conversation, the Energy and Sustainability and the Transportation Parking Commission, what are they to you? In that, insofar as that they're actually they are your committees to uh, provide services for you. What is it you expect from those two committees? And what, did, what is it that you need? Well, um, as we tried to spell out in their, in their charge, I mean, these are both um, committees that are providing guidance and advice on sweeping issues, I mean, in the city. Obviously, transportation, uh, parking um, is a multi-dimensional, those of you who've been city councilors for a while know that one of the big things we hear about is 
traffic issues and parking issues, speeding, um, parking, et cetera. Um, and um, in, in previous times, we had little silos that were dealing with all of these kinds of issues. People would go to the police department, people would go to the Department of Public Works, people would go to the Parking Commission, people would go to a city councilor, they would go all over the place. They'd go to the mayor's office, they'd go to their state rep. Um, and so we really felt like um, bringing together all of these people, um, these agencies that deal with all of these things in one place, in one uh, sort of a one-stop place that people could go, um, and that those people would be collaborating. Those department heads would be collaborating. They'd also have some citizens that were working with them to provide a citizen perspective, and then they would also have elected officials um, as part of that collaboration and making recommendations, whether it's you know, um, giving advice on a transfer sustainable transportation plan for the city or um, making recommendations about how to improve you know, speeding or traffic safety or um, making recommendations about um, the city's commitment to addressing climate change or energy reduction or whatever it may be. So these are some large portfolio issues that have, that cut across multi um, agencies. Unlike something like, you know, um, you know a, a very specific type of a, um, of a body that's really working in one subject matter area with maybe one department. This is a these are these are subjects that cross multiple departments. So that's why these were created in the first place, and um, and so I want them to be collaborative. I want them to, to work together. Um, and again, I, I frankly don't know the the, the a lot of the um, agendas and a lot of the the work that goes on behind the scenes between each meeting is carried out by staff. Um, and that's just what happens on these particular boards. Um, that's the nature of it. They're asked to bring information. They're asked to, you know, Mr. Hasbrook's asked to come bring information about building codes because that's, he's the, he's the code enforcement officer in the city, whatever it may be. Chris is bringing information. Other people, are, citizens are bringing information from their work, whether it's as professors or professionals, and that's what they do. So I, I don't think I'm asking the boards to change in any way. And I don't think this changes how the boards would function in any way. Um, so I'm just trying to trying to um, codify that the staff members or the directors would serve as ex officio chairs of the committees. So these, these boards provide for you a service as such as being advisors and helping you develop policy and, mm -hmm. and, um, and in some cases by extension legislation and ordinances. Mm -hmm. um, We've watched over time as these things evolved. I'll be polite and call them evolved, but sometimes that some of these committees um, sort of grew and developed, not unlike the way we did our road systems, essentially. And what? And actually, I think it's they're much improved from what they were when I was first elected to office, which is essentially, as, as we noted, when the charter was a little more muddy, and we weren't really sure who these committees served I mean well, who they provided information for and who they uh, who they helped develop policy for now it's clear under the Charter so that's what's what I think is important to focus on is what it, your expectations are and you've just described them so that I mean that's the most relevant and how you and it is at your pleasure how this most how you think this most can best function What's the most efficacious way to get the information that you're seeking? So, thank you. That's that's pretty much all I need to know. And, and again, it, and I would also just say it's, it's a model that I've seen in some other cities. That I look, when I looked around for how other communities have functioned, and I've, and I've found some other communities that have done this same model. With and I think that's where we got the idea from. And in some cases, you know, the police chief or the DPW director kind of convenes the meeting, um, um, and and brings people together and chairs and chairs the collaboration so that's so and in one of the questions the, uh, the presiding officer um, sets the agenda and manages the meeting is your understanding of there that's, any other that's the typically in under way? that's typically what's you know under Robert's rules and what's under the rest of the administrative code exactly um, the body functions as a multi-member body yeah and one other question do you happen to know who the chair of energy and sustainability is has been off and on for many years, Aiden Maynard, um, and, I, and I know he took a hiatus from the committee and then went back on the committee. He, he was 
reelected, I believe. Exactly. So I think he's probably been. Um, there wasn't an election last time, so. Yeah, I think he's been a chair for a long, 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 long time. I'm pretty sure. Um, but again, um, having come to your meetings, having served on the meetings, having having talked to Chris Mason, um, generally Chris puts the agenda together and generally the style of your meeting is that Chris often leads the meeting and leads people through the agenda because you've developed a very collaborative approach and it's a very informal approach and I think that's great and I don't think that's going to change. Yeah, and Chris so, is not a voting member. And Chris has never been a voting member and yeah, he's not a voting member. Okay. But his department is a, has a vote on the commission. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Um, I think I invented a rule and so it's going to be an optional rule for counselors to apply to themselves. I think one, uh, one, uh, two, one question, one follow-up question is what we can strive for. But I also know that counselors want equity among themselves, so they may push that a little bit. But in order to incorporate uh, everyone, and then we'll go counselor by counselor, that'll be what we'll try to do. Maybe a time limit instead, just because some questions are shorter answers than others. Well, for simplicity, I'm going to say one question, one follow-up, but if you want to blow past that, can't stop you. So, Council Bidwell. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, just, just because Peg Keller's name has come up, just a quick shout out. Um, Peg has been an invaluable contributor to the life of the city from the work in housing, affordable housing, on the homeless issues, from the CPDG administrator, a liaison to our social service agencies and housing agencies. And she's retiring, and I don't know if there's going to be another opportunity to do a shout out to her, so I just wanted to start off with that acknowledgement of her incredible work to the city. Um, I am a total advocate of our strong mayor, so-called system of government, and I very much appreciate the last charter and the upcoming charter uh, in their continuing work to clarify uh, the role of the legislative branch, the role of the executive branch to as much as possible uh, remove us from murky gray areas that have troubled us all in the past and created, uh, as you've described, a great deal of, of, of confusion. Um, I think drawing clear lines and being consistent is important. However, I, I, I do have a little, I, I don't totally buy the notion that consistency needs to be an end in and of itself, and in particular, I think at this point in time, the role of Transportation and Parking Commission uh, and the issues that it's dealing with, uh, not by any means to belittle those issues, we all rely on that commission and our good city staff to deal with critically important traffic issues and safety issues. Um, but at this point in time, the role of the Energy and Sustainability Commission in the debates in our society about how to address the climate emergency that has, we have to get our hands around immediately, <laughs> I think, for me, means we don't have to treat them consistently. There's nothing in the charter that says that they have to be treated consistently. I think the way we structure and think about our Energy and Sustainability Commission should be a function of the importance of those issues at this point in time. And it may be different than the way other cities do it because there may not be the level of engagement around climate and energy and sustainability issues elsewhere as there is here. And I think we, we need to acknowledge that we may very well be uh, different in other cities and we should regard that as, as a blessing that we have the level of activism and engagement that we do. And I would hate to see us do anything that would send a signal, even if it's symbolic, that that we want to that we want to change that or or discourage that i think there really is a difference between these two commissions and i think they should be treated differently and i think there's a strong argument i i i totally agree that uh, a city councilor should not chair these commissions uh, that would totally blur the lines that doesn't make any sense at all and i totally support as as do you having city councilors on these commissions i think the the robust conversation and debate that happens is to, much to be desired. But I think the current structure of uh, encouraging participation, encouraging democracy, encouraging buy-in by having that particular commission elect its chair, um, I think it's worth keeping. 
uh, even if it is different than the way we structure another commission, and even if it is different than the way uh, cities would handle an analogous situation, I think at this point in time, uh, it would make sense to hear what we've been hearing this evening and what we've been hearing from activists all over the city about this and recognize that this is a different situation and it warrants uh, a different treatment. So I, I, I support everything in, in the uh, changes to the administrative code, but I, I do have to push back on uh, that particular change. That, that would, I, I, think it's, I don't think it's the right optics at this point in time to say that the chair of that committee uh, is a mayoral department head. That doesn't mean that we don't accept the fact that it's an, it's an executive branch commission uh, and it operates on that side of the line, but I, I don't think it's the right message or the right optics or the right symbolism at this point in time to change the way that the, the leadership of that, uh, of that particular commission is selected. I appreciate that concern. Um, again, I would just go back to these are advisory commissions and the, you know, they're going to give advice and then the people who will be carrying out the work and the people who will be doing the work are the department heads, the folks that are on the commission doing the work. Um, so again, uh, totally understood. To the extent that who the chair is, will change that. I, I don't really know that it would change it. I, I agree with your idea of having no a bar on city councilors serving as the chair. Um, but again, I also want to stress that I may put school committee members on the Energy and Sustainability Committee in the future. They're probably our largest energy user. Schools are our largest energy user in the city. So I, I, mean, I'm just, I don't want to just say it's city councilors. It could be, right, right. It could, it's elected officials as it's written right now. But um, so I, I appreciate that. I don't agree with it, but um, and I don't agree that it's going to materially affect the urgency with which we address climate change. And I, um, having the director of planning and sustainability um, leading a sustainability commission, doesn't really seem incongruous to me. But uh, but I respect your opinion, as you know. Uh, no, I think I. My question has been asked and answered, or my point has been made. I, 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 I need make no further point. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. First of all, thank you for you know your thoughtful approach to uh, looking at all of these administrative matters. Um, I want to speak to the TPC as the chair of the TPC. We've had discussions about the way the TV, TPC is organized, um, and I've had discussions with other counselors as well. I'm, by and large, I am supportive of, of what you're recommending here, and I'm, I'm doing that, what, I wanna make that point now because I think the, the, um, the work that the TPC does stands out differently from much of all, many of our advisory committees that, um, that, it, uh, that people come to the TPC with real concerns about stuff that's actually happening on the ground, that it's, that it's operational, that there's people sitting who are part of the commission who can step forward right then and there and commit to doing something or go back to their offices and, or meet with you later, and um, that, uh, that it's not things, often it's not things out in the future that we're hoping for in terms of, you know, new solar arrays or anything like that. It's, you know, can we get some line striping, a crosswalk, a, a traffic light, and how we go about doing that. And that, um, that um, so having this more on the administrative side makes sense to me. Um, that uh, I, I there's a number of other things I'll speak to later when we're uh, uh, debating uh, this in more detail. But by and large, I'm supportive of this. I also sent you some recommendations, uh, some ideas for improvement, and maybe you can speak to those later, or, or would you like to right now? The, the idea of having the chief of staff preside or be part of the meeting, um, so as in my role as the chair of the TPC, I was often in communications with Chief of Staffs uh, Simmons right over there, and that, um, 
that your chief of staff is often coordinating and working with the different departments to pull together um, ordinances and orders that are related to traffic and parking. Um, and that it, to me it seemed like it was the missing piece in terms of the commissioners um, and I was interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I appreciate that suggestion. Um, again, then I'd be happy to add another member to the committee or someone, to another department person to staff it. It's not really, I mean, the, the chief of staff oversees a lot of city operations, but I feel like we've got the key people, department heads on there. I mean, I think that we can still continue to coordinate with them as ordinances come to city council, et cetera. I just, I don't feel the need to put the chief of staff, my chief of staff, <coughs> chair of the committee that um, uh, for those are, who are concerned about the, the mayor exerting their strength that might actually be a little too strong for people that I'm putting my chief of staff in charge and, I, and frankly they have too much else to do so I don't really um, I don't really support that um, but it's a I understand where it's coming from you also mentioned a concern about the referral of ordinances um, that there's some language in there about um, ordinances can be referred to it by the mayor or the city oh council. is in terms of um, you mentioned I, the um, yeah. and I didn't mean that the to commission limited. shall make and review recommendations on any <coughs> ordinance related to transportation and our parking referred to it by the mayor or city council I wanted to make sure that that it was broader than that that commissioners can actually raise things to yeah. discuss it and it wasn't meant said. to be narrow it was really meant to Again, sort of an update because under chapter 22 all ordinances were required to go to this committee um, they were all required to go to this committee under an ordinance that was adopted by the City Council approved by the mayor I can't I can't force uh, I can't force the council to refer things to my executive branch committee so I can't decree that any ordinance that you take up has to come to this committee um, so that's why I was trying to soften that language to say that you can refer it to things and I can re I can refer things to it but it's the, before it was sort of required that everything had to go th to this advisory commission of the mayor and I think that would be infringing on the independence of the legislature if I were to keep that rule in effect so that's what that was about it wasn't meant to say that all the other things that people want to bring it was really just about ordinances um, and the past practice of requiring that they be referred there Council Board 3 may now yield to Council Board 6, right? You're all set, Mr. Council? Thank you. Okay, Council Barch. Uh, Mayor, I want to thank you very much for explaining because I have some concerns myself um, with what the TTC, which I had talked with Councilor Nash about because I thought it was a huge responsibility for Councilor as chair and also That's how they felt about it, and they would say, well, we're going to call him and all this. I think this is the right way to go. These are expertise. This is what we have. We have a director of the Department of Public Works. She knows our roads. Do you have anything? No. Okay. Since all counselors have
have spoken. Uh, I will, would like to return to the audience, the public, and just ask if at this point the public has any further comments that they would like to make. So, Gordon, right? Yep. Yes, sir. Come on back up. Gordon Meadows. Uh, I am still deeply concerned by the recommendation of the mayor to put the planning department chair as, or at, in as our chair at the Energy and Sustainability Commission. I would, however, like to make sure that we are coordinating as best we can with the mayor because as he pointed out, we are simply serving in an advisory role. And as a member of that, I would like to know that our advice is being heard and I would really like to find a way to work with the mayor and the administration to make sure that our work uh, is uh, both being acknowledged and reflected in the plans that are being made and the policies that are being put in place. And I really do want to find uh, the best way to deliver that advice. And if his opinion is that that person uh, in charge of the planning department should be our chair. I respect that opinion, though I do disagree. Uh, I would ask that the mayor make that person a member of our commission. And as has been expressed with the urgency of climate change, I would request that the mayor make himself a member of that commission as well. And I apologize if that's not allowed somehow, and I don't know the rules. But I would ask that the mayor himself come to those meetings, because what must be done will have to be enacted by every single part of the city government, from the schools, which use all of the energy, to the roads, which will have to be uh, kept up for, for commerce. So we, we have an enormous amount of work that has to be done and sustainability and energy have to do with everything that this city does and they're all going to have to be different in 10 years. And there's just so much work that has to be done. So I am happy that the mayor is addressing the issue of how we can best advise him and his administration in the city. I would encourage him to make the planning uh, person a uh, member, not the chair, and make himself a member as well. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> would you like to respond to that? I would. I thank you, and I thank you for your service. Um, the planning and sustainability director is actually a member of the commission. That's already um, happened, and um, and I'm. I would only just say that. Um, oddly, if you read our charter, I'm a member of every multiple member body in the city um, by charter. Um, actually, I attended a meeting of the Council on Aging Board today in that role, um, exercise that authority. Um, I don't know that I can, come, I, would, I can come to every multiple member body, um, but I do work with all of the department's heads that are on that committee and the staff that are on that committee um, and meet with them on a regular basis, and they bring to me the recommendations that come from various commissions on which they serve, these two specifically. But um, so I'm very much engaged in the work of the commissions, but I don't know that it would be appropriate for me to um, serve or serve on it and go to every meeting. Um, so anyway, that would just be my response to that, but I appreciate where it's coming from and, and um, but that's my response. Great, thank you. Uh, other members of the public? Second bite at the apple, uh, Ms. Lumbar. Uh, I appreciated all the comments tonight. I, I especially appreciated um, Councillor Bidwell's um, acknowledgement that, uh, especially pertaining to the Energy and Sustainability Commission, we're, we're, we're really needing to operate through a completely different lens and with a level of engagement that we haven't seen before. Um, I, uh, I, I just reread the, the mission uh, by uh, according to the city charter of the Energy and Sustainability Commission and it, it, it pertains as much to the private sector as it does to the public sector. So those, um, so it's not just the department heads who are going back and doing the work. It's also members, members of, of the community and if actually you look at the city's draft 
uh, resilience and climate resilience and regeneration plan, they look to citizens for carrying out a lot of the work. An example <laughs> is that th this city is mostly heated by natural gas. Our municipal buildings are a small portion of that. There, there are a portion, but they're not, they're not 50% by a stretch. Um, it's, it's the homes that we live in. Um, we are going to, we need to solve this together and we need citizens to be bringing in ideas and going out into their neighborhoods to solve it together. And sometimes you need citizen leadership to, um, to carry that. I'm not saying every time. That's why you elect a chair. It may be that they elect the department, uh, the, the planning department head to be the chair, but that, but, but not always and not, um, not by default. So um, I, I think that, that we're operating in really different times. I'm coming up a second time because we all have to push ourselves into some uncomfortable zones, and I don't like pushing back on the mayor. I have a great relationship with the mayor. I, um, I don't like um, locking heads with any of the department heads, um, but I also know that like the stakes are so high and we are, um, having to operate outside of our comfort zone. So I, um, I, I, I remain fed, uh, steadfast that um, the, the, the chair of the Energy and Sustainability Commission should be elected by their peers and that we should maintain the opportunity for a citizen to be that chair. Thank you very much. Um, any other member of the public? Is there any member of the public who would like to speak for, or against, or? At, at all on this subject in the hearing? Okay. So, Mr. Mayor, you're a citizen point. after all, I, so. I just want to have one final uh, word. You're not a member of the city council. And again, I have, I have great respect for Lily. Um, I won't remind her that she did oppose the administrative order creating the Public Shade Tree Commission. Um, uh, and, um, no, you, you opposed it and told them to vote it Glad you're addressing uh, your comments to so, me. Exactly. This is our custom. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do want to say, I mean, I think I, I hear what people are saying, and I just want to kind of challenge it a little bit in that I hear people saying that if you have a citizen, if you don't have a citizen chair, then you aren't committed to the urgency of climate change. And I would say to you that um, I'm committed to that, and, I'm, and I think it sends a strong message to say I'm committed to it, and I'm actually putting five of our key city staffers on this commission, and I'm having some of our top people lead it. I think that sends an equally powerful message. So I don't think you can discount that. Um, and I would just ask people to consider that as an alternative in terms of the message we're sending and the message I'm sending that, you know, because department heads have a lot of responsibilities, it's true, and they're busy. And I'm saying to them, this is something that's important to my administration. I want you to be on this commission um, and you're gonna chair this. So you're not just gonna be a backbencher, you're gonna be there and engaged and, and helping to lead this effort on my behalf. So I just want to offer an alternative way to think about it um, and not that it's some weakening of our commitment to, uh, to climate change. I think we've been a leader on it and I think we'll continue to be on a, a leader on it, at least during my administration. So thank you. Yeah, and thank you for sharing that perspective. Both, both perspectives are important for the public to hear. Um, I am going to reserve my comments for the actual debate. Uh, proof would be a good example for the, <laughs> the rest so that we can proceed with the, the schoolhouse rock version uh, episode of the city council because next we're going to talk about the charter and some other things. Uh, but I will say, in order to interest you if you want to stick around, that I, uh, I, I spoke with the mayor today and I, I do have uh, serious concerns of my own that I will uh, express, but I will express them when we actually come to this agenda item. Councilor Bishop. We need a motion to close the public hearing. Uh, I'll do one more call of public comment. And hearing none, that would be perfect. Second. I made my motion. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of closing public comment, I mean, public aye. hearing, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, any abstentions? <clears throat> so we're closed. Okay, let's do this. Safe city. I want to do that because I'm not sure that's going to take that much time. Uh, so, do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. All right. <laughs> to approve 19153, the Northampton Safe City Ordinance. Made by Councillor Dwight and seconded by, was it Councillor LaBarge? Yes. Any 
any discussion on the safe city ordinance on second reading which was passed unanimously two weeks ago hearing no comment um, let's have a roll call on this ordinance Yes. 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 Is that all of us? So that passed yeah. on second reading and goes to the mayor for his signature. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> uh, it is something to be proud of. That's okay. All right. So now. Uh, we are going to go to a discussion and presentation. Now, let's skip our announcements and just go straight to this and, and go back. Uh, discussion and presentation of the Charter Review Committee recommendations. All right, we have some enthusiasm from some of the members. The, the chair is here, which is not better than nothing. The chair is here. Mr. Moulton and the vice chair are approaching the podium. Sam Hopper is the vice chair. And before you begin, I, I offer a very brief statement of, of thanks uh, to you as the leadership of the committee and to all the committee members, because I, I know how hard and seriously you worked on this for quite a long time. And the seriousness with which you gave these important issues about the basic structure of our city, um, I really can't overstate the importance of that. And so I want to begin by thanking you. Well, um, and so having said that, the floor is yours. We'd Thank love to hear an overview of what you've done. Thank you, uh, President O'Donnell and the other members of the City Council for, for hearing from us. Um, as, as you noted, uh, I'm Stan Moulton, Chair of the Committee, Sam Hopper, Vice Chair of the Committee. And we're really here to speak for the entire committee, all of whose members are actually here tonight. Ben Simmons, Roberta Sullivan, Dylan Gaffney, Bob Bullrice, Patty Healy, Molly Fox, and of course, uh, City Councilor Bill Dwight. Um, we recognize, of course, that the, the city council that is seated in January will be the council that will actually determine which of our recommendations go forward. But we wanted this opportunity to address the council that appointed us earlier this year and uh, to give a brief overview of both the process that we used and the, and the major recommendations that will be considered by the new city council and the mayor next year. Uh, our report uh, consists of, uh, of a summary of the major recommendations as well as an annotated uh, version <coughs> of the charter which were distributed uh, to you tonight. And that, of course, will be filed with the uh, city clerk's office later this month. Uh, it's important to note that the, uh, the report, our report was approved by unanimous vote 9-0. And, and in fact, nearly every vote that we took, with the exception of, of an occasional abstention, were unanimous. And I think that is, that is very significant. And I think the committee believes that the strength of our report results from the breadth of the topics that we considered, the weight of our major recommendations, particularly those that address equity and access in the city, and the unity of our members. Uh, we, held, uh, we held 19 meetings uh, between February and December. We heard from the public at, at most of them. And specifically, we had three public hearings uh, during the course of, that, of the course of this year, uh, one on election issues, a second on the question of uh, uh, electing, uh, or rather appointing, rather than electing a city clerk, a city clerk, and the third, to review our recommendations, but it was at that third hearing that we heard substantial testimony about extending voting rights in municipal elections to non-citizens. And while most of the testimony, the great majority of the testimony, the people we heard from were citizens of Northampton, we also cast a, a, a wider net outside the city to hear from experts and to get an outside perspective experts like Voter Choice Massachusetts, the group that advocates for ranked choice voting, and the Massachusetts City Clerks Association. We heard from the secretary of that body to help guide us on the question of, of an appointed versus an elected city clerk. In every case, uh, we heard near unanimous testimony 
even uh, on issues that previously had been contentious in Northampton or have been controversial elsewhere. And committee members uh, remarked that the testimony that they heard at these hearings was very helpful, very educational, informative, helpful in guiding and shaping our recommendations. We heard uh, really dozens of suggestions, uh, concerns, ideas uh, that came before us uh, from members of the public, city officials. Not all of them, of course, uh, in our judgment, rose to the level of being included in the charter. We, we do, however, we feel strongly that there are, are, are several issues that did not result in recommendations for specific changes in the charter, uh, but they're important enough we feel to warrant further study by, by city officials for inclusion either in this or in future amendments to the charter. And these are issues primarily related to the city's commitment to equity and transparency in government. And you'll find those uh, at the end of our summary under topics for further study in the categories of underrepresented communities, access to information, and access to elections. So I think that it's important for, for us as a committee to note that, um, you know, that there are things that we heard that we didn't uh, uh, make specific recommendations on, but we hope that the council, the mayor, and other city officials continue to consider those issues. And now Sam will summarize our major recommendations, and we'd be happy to answer any, any questions. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, thanks for having us tonight. I'll try to be brief since I know you've been here for a while and have more work to do. Um, so I'm going to start with some of our more major and popular recommendations, all which focused on expanding the electorate in the city. Um, so we recommend to lower the municipal uh, vote to 16, um, adopt ranked choice voting for municipal elections, um, mail ballots for municipal elections to all registered voters, remove the need to cite a specific reason for absentee ballot for municipal elections, and most recently, as Stan noted, um, extending voting rights in municipal elections to non-citizens. Um, another major recommendation we made um, is to uh, have the city clerk be an appointed versus an elected position. Um, moving on, uh, we voted to, um, oh, in an attempt to uh, remove obstacles to running for elected office, um, removing candidate for re-election on the ballot. Um, also, we cleaned up a lot of the temporary absence of mayor, um, this, it's section 3.7, and then also in the vacancy in the office of mayor, um, section 3.9, just so the timing actually makes sense. Um, and then also in the vacancy in the office of mayor, um, this was intended to uh, be more representative of uh, how the citizens vote. Um, so in the case that a mayor should step down um, after uh, a mayoral election, that instead of having the city council president take the office, that the mayor elect would take the office right away. Um, and that reminded me, we saw something like that play out in Westfield recently. Um, next, uh, something that we talked about a little bit and in invited Smith, uh, the superintendents of Smith Agricultural School, is a lot of work around extending school committee provisions towards Smith. Um, so for example, at the budget meeting in January where it's city council and school committee to also invite the Smith trustees. Um, and a couple of other things there. Uh, for filling vacancies of school committee and for the Forbes trustees, we recommended some changes just to make um, for Forbes to give them more autonomy in choosing uh, how, to, how they fill their vacancies. Um, and then for a school committee to um, allow for this to be defined under ordinance, how they do it. Uh, okay, I'm almost done. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and then this is a smaller change, but we talked about it a little bit, is for the independent audit to award a three-year contract um, just to give the auditor um, to be more efficient, essentially, so they have more of a relationship with the city um, and an understanding. And um, there's also, we did a lot of housekeeping recommendations, and that's all on the annotated charter. Um, 
And yeah, those are major recommendations. Thank you. So that concludes your presentation. Yes. Extremely concise and informative. <laughs> we value conciseness. It's like a <laughs> swallowing a dictionary in pill form. Thank you. Um, so, any questions from members of the council at this stage? Uh, do you, oh, Just one an of the members, to please. Sure. And and it's, we were quite fortunate, actually, because. Uh, actually understands leadership we this is a very well managed and high function committee given in given the breadth and depth of the issues and and their and their august nature Stan proved himself to be well worthy of task and, and honestly I mean uh, as he noted and uh, Councillor Seawall can attest to the previous meetings of the sort uh, as we were developing new charter were didn't necessarily go quite as smoothly um, this is as Stan noted we weren't always all of the same opinion but the fact is that we all came to consensus in, in a way that was uh, I, I haven't seen work as well in so many other committees in, including this body <coughs> but so I all props go to Stan and Sam they they run a good meeting, and their service here has, uh, I don't think we can actually estimate the value that, it, that they have contributed. So I want to just say, I, I think it's worth noting so that they get somewhere on community access, they get noted for that. <laughs> here, here. Councilor LaBarge. Yes, um, I want to thank you, Sue. Thank you, Stan, and all the volunteers from the wards who also participated from February until December. A lot of work, and I thank you all very, very much. Would anyone else like to thank Sam and Stan? <laughs> very deservedly. Um, this is one where if we started to get into it, we could really yeah. ha recreate your entire committee <laughs> yeah. tonight. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to do that. I, I just will, again, state my appreciation for this. I expect the next council will look at it very seriously. Perhaps they will not accept all the recommendations. And in a way, it's gonna, it will be a, a different stage of reopening the conversation. But this provides uh, a very ambitious, I, I think, basis for them to have that. <coughs> and, and so again, Thank you for all the work you did. And even though you're not on the committee, I assume as citizens you're, you're available for a discussion for this council or the next yes. as they have their deliberations. Yes, the committee will actually dissolve at the end of the year, but right. we as members uh, do stand ready to uh, appear again in 2020 before the next city council and uh, answer questions about our recommendations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, thanks. Question? Oh, Councilor Carney. Uh, just a Maybe a process question. I'm not sure if it's the committee or um, council president, but where do, or the committee uh, council representative, where do we go from here? What are the next steps? If you just quickly, uh, I'll just defer to the council representative. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, as as Stan noted, that this body won't have an opportunity to uh, vote on this, even though this was our charge by charter. Um, and we will have a substantial new body so there there will be we have this will be presented to us for consideration to send forward far uh, to um, to the legislature for appeal and then as well as the mayor and uh, and as council O'Donnell noted there could be um, some deletions there could even be some additions actually that, uh, and it's also worth noting that petitions for charter changes aren't exclusive to this. This is mandated by the charter that we have to go on a regular review so that we won't get stuck with something like we got before, which is basically a moribund, unusable document. So this is to keep us on our charge. In, um, this committee has done yeoman's work, as I've said. So, But the fact is, is that at any point, we can actually appeal for uh, petition a petition for a change of our charter but there will in all in my hope and, and, and 
I suspect the anticipation is that this body, uh, as it reforms, will um, consider these recommendations and um, follow through with a petition to the legislature for uh, modifications. I'd like to add to that, if I may. Please. Um, it goes to the legislature and then the governor and then things that come back that are major substantive changes will come back to the voters. Um, so they still would have to vote on it. Oh, well, it's, yeah. yeah, and that's up to the legislature how, ultimately, yeah, how, what, what comes back, what they pick yeah. and choose. They could be nice and just mm -hmm. simply say, you were all brilliant, you put in a lot of work and we say, go right. for it, good, good for you. <laughs> and, and not, not a one of us in this room believe that that's possible. So it's in all likelihood that they would send it back to us and put it on the ballot by the voters. <clears throat> that headline won't be that Councillor Dwight suggests skirting the will of the voters. <laughs> we want them to have their soul. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you again. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to go, we're going to do the order next. How about that? The administrative order? Sure. Okay. Um, but let's just clear these off. Does anyone have any one minute announcements or any kind of announcement? Checking, no. That was my one. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor, out of just checking, you don't have any communications in addition to anything else? I have lots of communications, but not for this second. Um, can I make it's It's like the one time I make a one minute announcement, and it's like three hours <laughs> into the meeting. But I would like to actually thank the Department of Public Works for what they did during the snowstorm. I really would like to thank them. I, I, I talked to Director Lascali on an un, unrelated issue, and I was I was told that um, haven't had this much continuous snowfall in Northampton since like 1996. That's true. They plowed the city seven times, wow. and there were no injuries or major accidents except Councillor Labarge had her mailbox knocked <laughs> off. <laughs> oh no, that's a, not true. I've had ten of them knocked down. You have ten mailboxes. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, you have ten houses, <laughs> but in any event. So the point is, um, the Department of Public Works did an outstanding job, and I just think they don't often get the credit they should. And so let's just, on, again, on NCTV, let's let's give let's make them celebrities and all thank them for their work. So, um, thanks. All right. So that takes care of my announcement. Now let's go and continue with Schoolhouse Rock and go to the question of the administrative order. Now, uh, 19174, an administrative order to amend the city of Northampton administrative code. Now, we do not have an actual order as an instrument to put on the floor. Is that correct? Correct. All right. All right. So according to the charter, what we're, I mean, we're going to do is make a motion. Someone's going to make a motion either positive or negative. Move that, approval. Second. Okay. okay. And that will serve as the, the mechanism in which we do that. So Councillor Murphy moves moves that you that we approve the changes that are submitted by the mayor. And Councillor Dwight seconds it. So discussion among the council. This is the council portion only. Anybody? Okay. So I promised oh, did you want to go? Oh, I just saw your pen move. Uh, oh, okay, I'm like can, a shark. You, you, I see you stuff. Can, you can take that as indication. Well, yeah. Go ahead, please. Uh, I, I just, I just wanted to, uh, uh, again, in, in our in our in our previous discussion, the the, the mayor made the, the the good point in response to Councillor Nash's suggestion that perhaps the chief of staff uh, might consider chairing the TPC. The comment was, well, the the uh, chief of staff has a great many things on his plate and it really wouldn't make sense, wouldn't have the, the time, the bandwidth to, to, to chair that commission. Well, I, th I, I really think that that same argument could be made for why our director of planning and sustainability, um, particularly with the expanded staff reporting uh, that he has to him based on these orders, I, I think it might very well be that, that that person might also have more on his plate than someone else who could devote themselves really to, to, to chairing that commission. I, I just think that it should be left to be decided at a particular point in time based on who the members of that committee are, 
who has what on their plate, who has what skills, who has what availability of time, that based on all of those factors, that committee would be best in position to determine uh, who for that period of time would chair that commission. And it could very well be that to say, the, the, we think that the best person to do this would be the director of planning and sustainability. Or it could be a, we think the best person to do, to, to do this would be a citizen. Um, but I think it should be decided by the members of that commission at that particular point in time. So that continues to be, having heard all the conversation back and forth, and the mayor and I talked about this earlier today, and I've come into this open-minded, but I still, I still come back to uh, liking everything in the uh, uh, changes to administrative code except for that one provision. That is, that is still my uh, objection to it. Thank you. Other councilors? Councilor Klein. <coughs> Through the chair. To the mayor, please. Um, one other quick question I forgot to ask. In that reduction in the housing partnership from the 15 to 11, do we see that happening by attrition or? Yes, it would happen by attrition. And I, th I wrote that in my message to you that oh, okay. we have some vacancies now. Um, so it would not affect any current members. It would just, they would, uh, yeah, so it will not affect any current members. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other members of the council? Councilor Klein. Um, just really briefly, I, I want to um, kind of reinforce this concept that I think it's really important that we as elected officials, including the mayor in this, um, that, that we take a charge very seriously, that we encourage leadership by um, residents of the city. And I think that these kinds of bodies are wonderful opportunities for us to be able to do that. And that includes um, having that breadth of uh, decision making amongst members of committees and commissions to decide who their chair and vice chair should be. And that um, residents can, in fact, step up and be, be the chairs and vice chairs. And I, I want to follow up really briefly on um, just commend uh, Councillor Bidwell in his comments about the Sustainability Commission. I absolutely agree that um, because of the climate crisis, we need to think about uh, who the best person is. The, the only difference that I, I guess I want to state is that it's more than optics. It's, um, you know, we're not doing it for optics purposes. We're doing it to actually achieve, to address climate the climate emergency in a very powerful way. So um, I just wanted to reiterate those points. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor. It'd be awesome. interesting hearing the council presence. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so let's see. I share a lot of the concerns, but I think I have a different spin on some of it. So let me just express um, what I expressed to the mayor today um, when we spoke by phone. Um, first of all, in, in the entirety of the order, and there's some strangeness here because we have to have an up or down vote on the entirety. We can't line item cherry pick. Uh, there's there are many worthy good things. I think it's it's great to transfer the ADA coordinator. Um, I think that will be more efficient and better serve the public. Um, I'm fine with moving you know community development into planning and, and so forth. I think that is is all very wise. Um, the issues that I have uh, concern three, three bodies, and one is the housing partnership, one is energy and uh, sustainability, and the other is um, transportation and parking. So let me just go through the specifics of each, and then I'll try and give you kind of a sense of the common theme of, of all of them. Housing partnership. The reason why there was a proposal, apparently from staff, to reduce the members is because they're having trouble getting a quorum. So it means you're having trouble getting a majority of people to show up to meetings. That's all that means. Um, I think it is probably too complicated to try and solve that problem by sort of depopulating the commission and reducing it. That's one way to do it. But I think a far simpler way would be to change the definition of what a quorum is. And that's actually something the city council has done for all its committees. A quorum is not a majority of the total possible spots. A quorum is a total of those who are currently serving. So 
that's actually a better way to do it, even if you don't have quorum problems. So if right now there are 11 members de facto on this commission, housing partnership, I think that's correct, um, you'd be all set because you have 11 members, and so therefore six would be a quorum. And apparently six is a, a quorum that you're comfortable getting. So you wouldn't have to restrict the housing authority's membership. It's not an ideal solution to do it that way. If you did, then you just put a cap on the number that can be on the housing partnership. But from my conversations with current and former housing partnership members, I have to say I, they can all speak for themselves, and one did, which I appreciate. But the sense I get is that it's far from an ideal solution. I think that the housing partnership has had many, has had ebbs and flows over time, hasn't it? And counselors know that. It's changed a lot. And I think during times in which you can get the people to have to a larger complement and still get a quorum, you should be able to do that. Because if you don't, then you're putting this kind of unnatural pressure to consolidate subcommittees and just de facto reduce the uh, workload that, the, that is possible for the housing partnership. And I just don't see that we need to do that. I think you could just have a quorum change rule and your, your quorum problems would be solved today. So that'd be a very minor change. And I'd be concerned about doing the, the side effects of doing it the other, which I think is more, ex not extreme, but too much. Um, the, other, the other two multiple member bodies, energy and transportation and parking. Um, first on the policy of it. I want to talk about policy, then I want to talk about law. The policy of it, I think it is undeniably better if you can have the possibility of citizens and city councilors chair either of the committee, committees, commissions. The reason I think it's better is because I think the purpose of the commission model is to <coughs> have more inclusion in policy making in the city. I think we recognize that when we have not just a diversity of opinion, but a diversity of interests, uh, we have better outcomes for people. The reason why that, the reason it was given to, to change that was that it's sort of impossible because we have a separation of, of powers now. And it's very important to, to as, as others have said, Councilor Dwight and others, to, to pay attention to that separation of powers. It's a serious issue. It's not something we can suspend because we wish it weren't there. It is there. But it, it is also so important that we should not misinterpret separation of powers. And I think we are about we, have, we sometimes misinterpret separation of powers in the course of our work here in the city, and I think this could be one of those times. And so my reasoning is this. Um, what is separation of powers? So pretty early on in the charter, we just debated the charter, what is section 1, dash 2, or dash 3, or something like that, it basically says something to the effect of the legislative branch shall not exercise executive power and the executive branch shall not exercise legislative. So that's the framework for this. And so by the way, first of all, I think right off the bat, that doesn't apply to citizens at all. And I don't think it applies in that specific way to say the school committee or to the community preservation committee. There are other separation of powers issues for the school committee. Um, but in and of itself, I don't see the separation of powers issue for those. Now, for the city council, if it were true that serving on a commission like this, meaning you deliberate, you vote, you, you know, you give your opinion, whatever, you offer things for the committee to consider, if that constituted the exercise of executive power, then by the logic of that is councilors shouldn't be on them at all. Um, and I don't think that'd be a good policy outcome, but that would be the natural logic of, of saying there's a separation of powers that going from a regular member, a non-chair member, to chair, I don't see anything about that that pushes you over the line from you don't have a, you don't undo, you, from, from not unduly exercising executive power to inappropriately exercising separation of power. I know chairs set agendas. I know they de facto have more kind of authority, if you will. But I don't see anything about that, that that makes this a separation of powers issue, especially for, as others have pointed out, an advisory body. So I don't see actual legal problem there. I think it's more of a policy choice of whether 
the executive wants to involve, wants city council leadership to be possible. I mean, I was the chair of the Transportation and Parking Commission, and I didn't campaign for it. I was made to do it in a very <laughs> mean-spirited way, but I did it for four years, actually. It was not fun. <laughs> it was not fun, but it was actually one of the more important things I did. It loses you a lot of support real fast because you got to tell people no. Um, and all the five counselors who have, 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 have been elected, congratulations at being the most popular you ever will be because it's only down from here. <laughs> Unless you just want to tell people what they want to hear. Unless you don't want to take hard positions and you're not here, to, you're not here for that. You're here to, to show leadership. And that's why I think it's important to maintain as far as the council goes. I'll be totally honest, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a partisan for the city council. I'm the city council president. It'd be weird if I didn't defend the institution of the city council and the legislative branch, which I believe in. And with regards to the, the next five councilors, this, the majority on this body is gonna change. We have five, we have a fresh, new, energized majority that's ready to come in. Um, I, as the, you know, the su supposed head of this branch or whatever you want to call it, at least a member of it, I cannot leave them with substantially less influence on key issues of green energy, public safety, and others um, than I had. I just don't want to diminish their role, and it would be a diminishment. So as a policy matter, I don't think it would be a good outcome. Um, I don't. I actually am a little uncomfortable making that decision for others. In fact, I almost wish this could be decided by a new council, rather than this one. I almost think it's more important for them to do that than, than us. So that leads me to my conclusion, um, which is, I said this to the, the mayor. You know, I. Um, we have this up or down vote, but I, I, I hate to frame it in this kind of adversarial sense. My request is not vote it down. My request is um, could we, uh, could it be revised and resubmitted with some changes? I mean, Councilor Bidwell raised some changes that I think are less substantial than mine in a sense. Others have raised changes. There are other little things, for example, I would love the Energy and Sustainability Commission if we're redefining its uh, jurisdiction, and, and I don't know if we do that or not. But we could. I would love to see environmental justice spelled out in it, which is not now. That's an important issue that um, deserves attention, which I believe the commission does pay attention to already. But little things like that. So my, my position is I'm not going to vote in favor of this because I, don't, I want to protect. <laughs> separation of powers is important. And the city, so the city council needs to stand up for the city council. All my colleagues were elected to represent constituents through the city council. You should, I, respectfully, you should not support something that takes power away from the city council. And power is something that is actually very important. Not all power is bad. You need a balance of power. So I urge my colleagues not to support it, but, but really what we should do is maybe just um, have a new council, a new, a new council president, because I will not be council president next year. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm appreciative, a lot of people were, we're very careful not to bring up people's names. They spoke about positions. And that's how we should have this conversation. So the, whoever the next council president is and the mayor, I think, should, should work on a revision of this to address some of these very serious issues. And let's do that before we act tonight. Um, so I hope people can understand my position on that. Um, that's it. And so uh, uh, Councilor Dwight and the mayor, of course, could respond if he, if he wishes. I, I do, in fact, understand your position. Yeah. And respect your position, and in fact, respect everyone's positions in this debate. As you know. But at the same time, I, mean, I think some of the concern on the separation of powers issue, particularly as it relates to transportation parking. I mean, we're talking about two. So basically, we're talking about two committees here, as far as that goes. The housing authority point is the coaching point. I, I, I don't, I don't disagree with that. The but on the two commissions, it seemed to be the ones, the, the focus of most of the discussion. Um, they function very differently. They, the, their, their processes are different. They, uh, the, I've served on energy and sustainability for six years, maybe more, and, and, and actually an iteration of it before it actually was called such. 
Um, in point of fact, actually, there's always been this presumption of how that meeting is conducted and presided over by Chris Mason. Uh, Chris Mason, he, he's not, he doesn't make me very comfortable because we do have an elected chair, but who has never served as such and never presided as such, never set the agenda, never presided, and it just makes me feel a little uncomfortable insofar as how we do process. And, and I always felt that essentially part of my job there was serving as the cop, you know, the one that sort of keeps us on point. We speak to items on the agenda. We don't stray off course and stuff. Um, but no, nothing's official there insofar as that goes. The recommendations, the robust debate that everyone describes actually occurred despite all these circumstances. Still happens, would happen, and I, and I still haven't heard persuasive argument mm -hmm. from me that would change that, would change the circumstances on the ground as that committee functions. We have, we have actually, there are brilliant people in that committee who uh, are not shy advocates and would not suffer as a result of a different, depending on who's presiding over the meeting. I don't think that would make a difference. The, the meeting would probably run a little differently, probably recognition, doing more uh, abiding by Robert's Rules of Order recognition. I mean, right now it's a freewheeling conversation. Maybe it could still stay as such, regardless of who's the chair. That's, But as, as it works now, it's informal, and which is effective, I think. It does, we do have, we do have, uh, as, as people have all testified, particularly the last one, a very hearty and robust debate. Part of that debate was how the hell are we supposed to do what and what are we supposed to do as a body, not not even beyond you know what the the the, the greater existential questions about uh, the impacts of climate change. To your point about now the getting in transportation and parking, the issue of division of powers does become a little more critical there because actually, in some cases, the uh, chairs historically have given directives to department heads, which that does step over, at least by my calculation, the uh, 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 the separation of powers. It's a shortcut. I mean, theoretically, they could go to the mayor, say this is what the committee has said, and then the, the mayor in turn would give the uh, directives to the, to the department heads. But that, again, is not something that actually happens on the ground. That's not something that actually happens. It's just, sort of the way things e informally evolved. And for some people, who consider it to be more efficacious. Uh, in this case, in the fact, due to the fact that these are mayoral committees and this mayor has made this request, I have not heard a compelling enough case to resist or oppose his request in that respect. I think the issue of optics is not the reason is not the reason we make rules. I hope. We, I mean, we've had these discussions before on any other issues. We don't make laws and we don't make policy based on optics or what what looks good. It, it doesn't detract from the expressed urgency, for instance, uh, and the emergency status of climate change and what it means to us existentially. That, that whoever presides over. The community at large is not reading between the lines and seeing that there's actually some kind of suppression or, or uh, an additional emphasis if you if you change that. So I, I um, I'm inclined to resist your appeal. I'm inclined to support this as a stand, uh, principally because, as I said, I think the mayor has made a request that we have not actually, to my at least my standards, uh, there has not been a compelling enough case to defy his orders or his request in that respect. Thank you. And not to violate the O'Donnell rule myself. <coughs> Go for it. It's, you make them, you can break them. So. It's true. It's a power. I, uh, but I, I would like to address some of your, because I, I appreciate your position. Um, I mean, just to be clear, you raised several issues which which I, I have not argued. I have not made a case about optics. No, I, I agree. Yes, and I, I, I have actually not made a case about how these commissions are insufficient to address 
our local climate needs. I haven't made those cases. That's not my argument. Um, and insofar as um, counselors giving orders to departments, um, I'm aware that sometimes counselors do go rogue on this. So I won't name name names, and they ought not to. Um, I agree with you. That is a very clear separation of, of powers. I do not believe that that general problem is healed, healed uh, or, or prevented by preventing a counselor or a, or a citizen from chairing a committee. Um, perhaps, by the way, it might be the case if this were revised and resubmitted, you would end up, my second choice would be citizens could chair, but counselors could not if that were indeed the concern. I don't really think that is the, the concern for me. The concern for me from the council perspective is the legislative branch does provide a very important role in legislative leadership. Um, I'm not going to brag only because I know no one will re remember what I bragged about. So, well, so therefore, I'll do it anyway. Um, you know, in the Transportation and Parking Commission, you know, I, I brought a, a, an order to reduce the default speed limit to 25 miles an hour in the city. It's still under consideration after a long time. That came because of me. Um, you know, I, I wrote an ordinance to expand the number of school zones in the city. Uh, that came because of me. I'm, I'm aware of, of many proposals that have come in the Energy and Sustainability Commission. Um, it came in part because of the city council. And I also know, by the way, a lot of people in the city who called me and says, and said, Ryan, I don't like any of your ideas. <laughs> so I'm not saying these are all like proof that any particular direction is good. What I am saying is that there is an opportunity there for the city council to express itself through a multiple member body, which indeed is established by the mayor, but it, it's not, and I know the mayor does not make this case, but it's not owned by the mayor. You know, it is a city body. And the way, and the way it is now is, is somewhat mixed. And I guess I'm hearing an argument that separation of <coughs> powers cannot tolerate that arrangement. And all the good things that can come out of it um, are negated because it, it can't survive in that environment. But I just disagree with that interpretation of separation of powers. I think that's too strict. Um, and I don't think that's accurate. Again, if it were, then the order should say counselors can't even be on the commission. That would be the natural, logical conclusion. So careful what you argue. Maybe you know, maybe people will come back with a revised thing that would be worse. But that would at least be, in my mind, consistent in terms of a legal theory. So yes, an opportunity to of course. Down on violating the O'Donnell rule. Uh, the O'Donnell rule <laughs> bit the dust a long time ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah and to those other points, I, I was not referring to. I was making a more general. Fair argument, enough. Yes, I, I, yes. The, the one point was <laughs> the point of fact about the, uh, the participation of counselors. I. I, I Everything you suggested, for instance, the, uh, uh, the reducing the 25 mile hour speed limit, wasn't you didn't make that by dint of or virtue of the fact that you were the chair. You would have done that anyway if you were a participant uh, as a member, I would imagine. I know you. I've seen you do that. You've done that here when you weren't the presiding officer. That doesn't necessarily determine that you have a unique ability in establishing or recommending changes or laws or anything else or recommendations or, or policy proposals those are not that's not the exclusive province of a chair um, and so it's not it's not an exclusive thing in that respect and I don't I don't want that message to be projected and I think part that partly informs sort of the argument against this I know that you know some of the unspoken discussion and I'll take it back to the committee that I've served on is energy and sustainability is part of the resistance is and the concern is about a particular department head and the particular department heads and whatever is projected on the particular department head that, that they will somehow dampen or modify or uh, uh, reduce the vigor by which we must proceed just by virtue of their position or this is their attitude and I think that's the concern that's part of the resistance I'm hearing it's unspoken but it's it's been spoken more overtly in other other venues but it, it is and it's true I, I think a presiding officer actually if they really were to be dictatorial and and uh, took advantage of various 
authorities that are granted them under Robert's Rules of Order could probably stifle, if they were bent on it, could stifle debate, discussion, and, and even process. And um, regardless of whether they're department head or whether they're a citizen or council. But I, I, I think that concern's unwarranted. I've never seen that played out in the city, never. Um, the presiding officer always allows for and promotes, and that's been true of this body, it's been true of even, even, even energy and sustainability when no one could identify who this is, the presiding officer was. No one really knew who that was. Debate was never stifled, and I'm sure that's true of transportation parking, at least the ones that I've had the privilege to witness. Um, so I, 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 the, the force of the argument that I've heard so far from, from uh, the public and, and, and here on the floor still does not really, doesn't reach for me the threshold that, that would qualify it for, for turning it down. But, you know, I get a sense of the room, so I <laughs> put that in this case I will, uh, I, but I, I, was, I remain committed to my, uh, to my affirmative vote. Rather than go back and forth to other counselors, uh, we have Councilor Carney then Bidwell, is that correct? You work out the order, so Councilor Carney. Thank you. <clears throat> I think it's really interesting that we had the presentation on the charter um, and the work that's being done now and the looking at the charter because that's kind of what this is re really all about it seems to me um, I, I have heard uh, comments about um, um, strengthening the role the legislative branch I mean we do have we have an in interesting um, form of government in Northampton with a strong mayor system during a time when we're dealing with a very <laughs> kind of un, you know, federal level, unpopular executive uh, corruption, dare I say. Um, so, you know, I, I totally understand why, um, and have often said to folks who have argued um, some of their complaints about the, what really is reflective of our strong mayor system, meaning that we have no authority on the city council over department heads, over the practices, over the uh, policies of our uh, of departments. We have control over the budget, finances. We create ordinances and laws. And um, you know, I have asked people, would you, you know, would you like to have a town manager system? I mean, there are there are uh, uh, options. But that's not what we heard tonight. We know that there's been a lot of work and that will go forward into the next council in terms of considering how we move forward with the charter. In this case here, um, so I, I really understand the sentiments and that's why, um, and having served as a counselor chair of the Transportation and Parking Commission, um, it's a lot of work to chair those <laughs> to chair those commission meetings and at the same time at least that particular commission and I'm sure that and it, that um, there weren't citizen members at the time that uh, it, it, you know in many in many scenarios it's never going to be a competed election on any of these committees I can't imagine it's usually who is willing, <laughs> who is willing to chair, um, typically. And so, I, so uh, there's a couple of things. I wouldn't want to squelch citizen participation. I think it's really important that citizen members, uh, having served on city services also for so many years now, the people who devote themselves to our various committees and commissions are you know and and often unrecognized I mean it, it's a lot of work to come and do this and those folks are uncompensated but um, if there is an uh, you know f what I heard tonight was a suggestion at least in these committees that there is a an understanding of a, a presiding officer as 
one who sets the agenda and runs the meeting. The more important job really is the clerk, <laughs> is the person who's, you know, I mean, from my experience on transportation and parking, it, we, we were oftentimes, you know, that the chair of the commission had to also be the clerk and take the minutes at the same time. I know we've corrected a lot of that. We've uh, managed to have folks, I'm not sure, uh, uh, who, is, who is doing the minutes in transportation and parking? Because I heard Chris is doing them in. Beth Copwood. A citizen member? DP. Okay, so we have devoted staff because there was a time when we actually didn't even have staff to do that important work and it was left to the chair to not only chair the meeting but to also try to capture all of the whatever was going on. So uh, my sense is I do see this as a genuine attempt to try to um, use city resources such as staff to do the important work of committees such as presiding over a meeting but also certainly recording minutes. Um, and I don't have the skepticism that I've heard shared while I understand it, while I understand it because we're at a time where, you know, uh, um, folks might be leery about. And though we may be leery, this is what we have. We have a, we have a system of government that has a separation of powers to provide checks and balances. <coughs> so our role in terms of any of those committees and commissions is to provide that advice and consent which we do on city services through our appointments process. And um, while I understand the folks that spoke really uh, eloquently about the need for um, <coughs> more citizen involvement, I don't know that um, this assigning of a chair to do particular work of a committee rather than to control in such a way um, actually diminishes the role of the citizen members on those committees. So that's that's my sense of the matter right now. Thank you. Uh, really sort of a procedural question either for the council or for the, or for the mayor. If, if this body were to um, not uh, either to, to, to table or to vote it down. Mm -hmm. what, what are the practical implications um, of, of, of that in terms of what are, what, are the, what are the timing issues as to when changes to this code either have to be made or the mayor would prefer that they be made? So I guess that's a question to the mayor. Well, the, the mayor can certainly respond if he wants. I'll just very, very briefly, I mean, I, it, it seems to me the mayor can submit orders whenever he pleases for consideration and that starts a 60-day clock for us to act. Um, it, logistically, in terms of his administration, he would have to comment on that. And you're welcome to if you wish. Yeah, the charter, you. Is, uh, you know, the charter uh, lays out the timeline and there's certain requirements. Um, again, to your point about advice and consent, if I submit an order to you and you say, that's lovely, we don't care, I mean, the, it goes into effect after 60 days. So it's like the budget, it's like any of those other matters. You have to, you have to act on it. So you can't just say, we're gonna keep tabling this, we're gonna table it. And again, I think that's, so the charter basically says that you have 60 days to act on it. You don't have to act on it, um, but if you do nothing with it, it actually goes into effect um, because that's sort of the form of government we have and we need to keep, keep the executive branch moving, which running the day-to-day -day operations of the city. So. It's really, and the charter is clear that it can't be amended. Um, it's it's really an up or down vote, much like your appointments. You don't get to substitute. You know, I don't like your appointment. I want this person instead. It's like you're you're advising and consenting on what the executive is putting forward. So that's really the options at this point. Um, and um, so I, I don't, I'm not really sure how I can't amend it at this point um, because you have to go back to the beginning send to the city clerk, post it in the newspaper. Um, and there's, so it's sort of, that's sort of the, I know it's kind of rigid, but that's the process that's laid out in the charter, yeah. I, I understood the question to be, what would be the process if we turned it down? Does that create any 
undo. I mean, just you would the status quo is what we would have for until such time as you submitted and started the process over. That's that's the answer. That would be correct. Right. Yeah, that's that's correct. Okay. But I do want to correct again, just emphasizing that um, you know there's nothing in the administrative code now that says city councilors will serve on these bodies. I just want to you know because you keep I keep hearing that it's city councilors, city councilors. We actually changed that two years ago to say elected officials. So I just want to be clear. Well, I'm aware of that. Yeah. Sorry. And and I think. I think that strengthens my argument because I wouldn't say the separation of powers uh, principle applies in the same way to a member of the community preservation committee or school committee than it does the city council. So that's a calculation and it certainly doesn't apply um, to citizens. But yeah, there's no question that you could appoint different elected officials. Yeah, that's not a dispute. I, I still think that it, as a practical matter, we, well, when I became council president, I recommended to you appointments and you made and you chose to make them. That's how we did it. And so as a practical matter, I think every 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 two years you'll have a council president, whoever it is, making recommendations because the council wants representation on these two vital bodies that deal with climate and energy and transportation and walkable communities and public safety, things our constituents care about. Council, I mean, agenda setting is influence. And I from my perspective, as a counselor, I, I, I want to guard that influence, even though you're not required to appoint a member of the city council. Was someone else waiting to be recognized? Counselor Dwight, were you? No. Oh, no. Anyone else? Um, I don't belabor the point. I just want to be very clear. This is a conversation about, a very technical conversation about a lot of different details. I see some pe members of the audience you know, you know, perhaps struggling to find interest in all of them, and we all, and that that's totally natural. Um, I think that when we get into details like this, we tend to like, search, and grope for themes to say, and so we wind up on things that really no one is saying. At least I'm not saying. I am not saying that um, city departments are terrible, or it's like the times we live in with bad government elsewhere, or it's going to stifle debate or this is about strengthening the executive unnecessarily. What I am saying is that um, it is important for city councilors who are elected to the city council to protect the legislative uh, branch's uh, influence on behalf of those who answered our request uh, to, for them to give us power through the electoral process and exercise it on their behalf. And these are multiple member bodies which of span jurisdictions and have since um, well mostly since they've been around and so I just can't with a new council coming in at the end of the year I just can't take that influence away from them on these key bodies when I feel that we could really in fact go back to the drawing board it wouldn't take forever and we could have a more collaborative process and maybe have something a little better with some some changes in it that could be supported so that's my position and I won't reiterate myself, reiterate my position. Uh, so anyone else? So Councillor Klein. Um, I just want to say here, here on everything that you said, I agree with, uh, with, with um, your analysis. And I just want to um, make perfectly clear that I am not casting aspersions at all on any department heads. In fact, I, you know, think the the current department heads are all pretty stellar and um, would do a great job as uh, chairs and vice chairs of these commissions. My issue, on top of uh, the things that Councillor O'Donnell has articulated, is really that I see this as an opportunity and a charge for us to really lift up the um, and empower uh, residents on committees and commissions and to, to give them kind of a gateway or a pathway towards being more engaged in civil governance and you know potentially thinking about running for office or um, you know really just stepping up for these particular commissions so that's that's really the piece for me I think the rest of the administrative order makes complete sense I think it's the two commissions that are the sticking point for me and because of that, I'm inclined to um, unfortunately vote it down. I think it's a, it's a real conundrum that we you know, can vote this up or down um, because 
you know, other than the, that, those two sticking points or that one sticking point for those two commissions, I, I feel completely fine about everything else in this. So that's uh, that's where I land with this one. So, uh, Councilor Dwight and then Tim Rogers. Just simply say I, I agreed with everything you said. With the one, well, the one difference being that I don't think uh, a councilor's authority or power and ability to conduct themselves as a legislative member is diminished in any way by not by being denied and, and we'll disagree on that point obviously sure of course but but, but the rest of it absolutely is spot on because it's not uh, these issues tend to become personalized they become right. they become less specific to the position and more about the person who holds that position I and I'm grateful for you making that distinction and so amen to all of that Appreciate those comments, yeah. Councilor Goodwill. Well, I too want to make the distinction between the the, the, the conceptual holder of these of, of these uh, positions in city government and the actual people who are there, who they all know. I have great respect for them and have worked closely with, with with them all. So it's so it's not about that at all. I do think there is power in the chair, uh, and I think uh, we should be maintain flexibility as to who is the best person at any given time to chair these commissions. And I think it's important enough that we should get it right. Even if I, 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 I agree with 95% of this, of this uh, order, of the changes to the code, it is a conundrum that we can do nothing but vote up or down. I think it's important enough that we should uh, I will vote it down. I will vote uh, vote no reluctantly, and I would encourage others to do so, uh, to allow time to get it right. There, there isn't any magic ticking clock here that says this has to be done uh, by the end of this year by this council. I think the council president makes a good argument for why uh, the incoming councilors should have a should have a say on this. So I will uh, reluctantly vote no and would encourage a collaborative process working with the mayor to make some uh, adjustments and bring it back. Thank you, Councillor. Any other members of the council uh, to comment on this? Uh, oh, Councillor Nash. <coughs> so, um, So, uh, as usual, all of your arguments get me nice and conflicted, and I thank you for that. Um, that um, I, you know, in terms of the TPC, I, you know, I still stand uh, with the mayor on these recommendations. Uh, that um, that and, you know, I, as far as chairing the TPC, it has been the. Um, it has been the most interesting experience for me on council in terms of um, working with our fine department heads and all of the, the people in the city and uh, with the people who work for the city and for the, the citizen members on the committee. But I, I have to say that it's, it's such a rough fit for the chair to be a counselor and that um, and that you know that, uh, that it creates the perception that of authority that you know that the chair doesn't have. Uh, yes, they're having the the power to you know the, being the the chair to set the agenda. Um, there are some um, some great things that can happen through that. But I I also think through just being a committee member, you know, working with whoever the chair is and getting things on the agenda and you know and also that if um, by working with you with my colleagues here we can send forth things over to the TPC where they will um, you know not just be you know put forth by a member of the TPC but it's something that they need to the TPC needs to consider um, and I, I think that that for um, uh, you know, that I, I think for me that serving as simply as a counselor on the TPC would put me more in an advocate role.
than I currently am. Because right, the, the, being the chair, there are sensibilities in terms of working with all of the different departments. And um, that, um, that as an advocate, as a counselor, just the, sitting on the TPC, you can do a little more calling out and saying, you know, what's up with that TCA that we discussed last month and things like that. Um, that um, and I, I think that's our natural role as far as the TPC, is to be, you know, a bit of a gadfly, keeping things, you know, keeping, you know, the discussion on what we're hearing. And, um, and also I think that many of the matters that, you know, um, that, for example, you mentioned the 25 mile an hour speed limit, that, that started here at council, and that's why it's still sitting exactly. over there. Um, that um, I, I think that, you know, if we work our committees on this side of, of the city, that we, we can get much of, you know, we can still have that. In fact, I think we have more power because we're, you know, we have our own council rules dictating when things need to come back. And um, so I, I'm not so worried about that loss of power. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, we as colleagues can hold each other accountable and we can get things done. When we're part of a committee, we're looking at each other and we're like, yeah, you know, and, and I think that happens on this, I know that happens with city administrators as well. And that, um, that being the, the chair and throwing out, so what are we gonna do? We have this topic of this parking space. Where's it gonna go? And not have, it's the strangest thing to be the chair of a committee where you're not really able to push anybody in any direction. That, um, you know, I've worked with volunteer boards where I've, I feel like they're volunteering and I have more authority. And this is not saying anything bad about the city leadership or the city departments. It's just that they are on the other side and that their ability to get things done mm -hmm. as colleagues is much more effective than, than having a, uh, a counselor chairing the commission. And so um, it, it's my hope that things will be more streamlined and more effective and um, and the majority of what people are coming there for is they want to see things happen quickly. It's tangible. It's on my street. It, I saw them drive by, and um, and there's people in you know city department heads can address many of those things. So, um, um, so I I'm very much on board with this. I'm sorry, it's getting light. I'm really going long. <laughs> Thank you. But um, th th so I'm comfortable with these changes with the TPC. I'm comfortable with just about everything else in here. I, I understand the reservations people have about what's going on at energy and sustainability. Uh, but it, uh, it sounds like that the current way that things have been running um, haven't been following the model that we're talking about in the first place. So, um, um, you know, I, so uh, I, you know, I, I think I'm inclined to vote for this uh, uh, tonight unless there's an idea to put this off for a while and, um, and, um, if, and I guess it would be up to the mayor whether he would like to, um, you know, uh, hear some, you know, hear what we have to say and maybe make a few tweaks. Otherwise, I think this is what we have. And um, okay. and if that's it, I'll be voting for it. Okay. Uh, so yes, at the hour growing late, Councilor Barge, you had. Yeah. Um, yep. I, like I said before, I'm very pleased with what the mayor has brought in, and a lot of the issues that Councilor Nash just brought up, I had great concerns about it too, with the city councilor being chair in the TPC. Um, and I also feel too that this is going to be, and I think it's going to work out very, very well for all the commissions in here. Thank you, Councilor. All right. Um, I don't know that anyone's going to change anyone else's mind at this point. Just a call question. Uh, so, uh, sounds like we're ready for a roll call vote on this. All right. 
Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? No. Councillor LaBarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? No. Councillor uh, Bidwell? No. Okay, so um, the vote uh, passes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Five, and five in the affirmative, three in, in negative. So uh, the uh, order is approved. So what's the council's pleasure? We still have uh, an override, and we have Great. pesticide, but we could have a recess. Please. So 10 minute recess, approximately? Yes. Okay. Usually runs over. Oh. Hmm. What? Just now or now, before? The day after Thanksgiving. <laughs>
My age, right? Yeah, we are. 55. Okay. All right, we are back. Sick me out. My voice is gone. 
All right, so we're back. We have no monitor. That's okay because a piece of paper and we learn to read. So let's see. We're gonna do some stuff. First thing, counselors. Let's let's focus and let's let's get back and finish this stuff off. Sorry. Um, the first thing we're gonna do. Do you wanna do the? Um, I wanna do liqueurs. Is that okay? Yeah. One eighty four. Sounds fancy. You don't wanna knock off consent. Okay. Can't do consent until we do first the city services subcommittee. Ah uh, yes. Right. But then you're right. Then we should go proceed to the consent. We're ready for that if you are. Well, let's do this. Let's do nineteen one eighty four in order to accept master General law chapter one. 38, section 12, permitting cordials and liqueurs. Move approval. Second. Made and seconded. Um, so let me just, uh, the mayor's here. Would you like to present this, Mr. Mayor? Uh, uh, as I tried to outline in the various whereases, um, this is an option within uh, Mass General Law the, uh, that pertains to liquor licensing um, that will give cities the option um, to allow license holders who hold a common victuallers, victuallers license as well as a wine and malt license um, to be able to seek a special license to serve liqueurs and cordials. Um, and, uh, and this actually came, um, I actually didn't really know about this uh, section of the law. Apparently it's common in some other communities, including in Boston. Um, and one of our newest restaurateurs, who's uh, located right across the street from City Hall, Andrew uh, Brow, came and spoke to uh, me about it and let us know about it. And um, so I um, put it uh, forward to the License Commission. Um, they unanimously uh, endorsed it. Um, and so I'm asking the council to vote to adopt this section of law. Um, it still will require the License Commission to develop a licensing procedure, and these licenses, like all licenses, still have to go to the ABCC for approval. So um, it's not like automatic. Everybody suddenly has this ability. They have to actually apply for this uh, special add-on license. So but they have one. They can amend it, basically. Uh, they can then come back to the, um, they can come to the License Commission and seek this additional seek the license on they don't have to but if they choose to want to serve uh, cordials and liqueurs and if you wanted if you'd be willing to recognize um, uh, um, Andrew he could at least give you an understanding of what this would entail uh, or how it might impact his restaurant if you wanted to do that I know he's moved to recognize Andrew Is there a second to that motion any discussion all those in favor aye. Aye. aye any opposed abstentions Um, yeah, thank you for being here. Any Absolutely. any background you could provide uh, would be welcome. Yeah, so um, the option to provide cordials and liqueurs would kind of elaborate my business to obviously offer something new and different, uh, Amaro's, uh, Irish coffees with some Baileys, things of that nature, uh, which just kind of make my business a little more valuable for me. Right. Just Actually, oh, we go Karin. Clarifying question for, for the chair. Please. Um, so presently, the license you have doesn't also allow for liqueurs and, and no, it's only um, malt and um, malt beer and wine. wine. Beer and wine. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Oh, oh, I yep. understand then. Yeah. So, it, so yeah, it's not like full full vodkas. You can't do anything like that. It's just cordials. I see. Yep. So I, I okay. So now I understand yep. the um, difference in the licenses. Yep. <coughs> uh, for the record, I, I've heard um, at least one other operator of a restaurant. In, in my time, tell me they would like to have this. And actually, at one point I looked at it a little bit myself. Yeah. So just be something else, something extra to offer. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So it's not just like just just so the public knows, it's not just a gift to you. It's just a general right. policy. It's any it's a Yeah. Could, anyone could, if yeah. they're eligible, could apply mm -hmm. for it. Yep. Yeah. And Councilor Dwight. I think an go. important point in here is uh, whereas liqueurs and cordials are defined as flavored spirits product containing not less than two and a half percent by weight sugar dextrose. Levulose, which <laughs> I haven't really had an experience with, I don't think. Delicious. But also, they're <laughs> and as a result, also their their alcohol content is uh, not the equivalent of hard liquor as it's all, as we come to know it or understand it. Um, so this would serve as <coughs> essentially an enhancement to a wine and beer license, and would provide more options for restaurant tours to um, offer something that's actually considered fairly common in, in restaurants all over the country, an opportunity to have a cordial or liqueur before, you, uh, before or after your meal. There you go. Yep. 
I thank you. Uh, Councilor Barr, do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, um, I have to agree that I really feel that this would be an enhancement, and I think mm -hmm. we would like this here in the North Hampton, especially our city, which is very vibrant, and if it's going to help a business, then I think it's our job to make that happen. So, I don't know, I've never had this type of a drink. <laughs> I wish you the best of luck. <laughs> if, you know, it all goes well with that. that. Thank, thank you, Councillor. So, if there's no other discussion, we have a motion on the floor, is that correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I really should. One, one question. Then. Oh, this please, yes, mayor. of course. Does this apply to seasonal <clears throat> licenses? Will this be available to the season mm -hmm. license holder? Um, <laughs> I don't really have many um, I mean, seasonal license holders. Um, well, I know one in particular, but. Okay. Yes. Well, but <laughs> we, have a, we have a special act that allows seasonals to convert to full. Full to full. Uh, beer and wine. Um, who, is, uh, just offhand, name who that might land, just so I understand. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm trying to picture who that I, I, I would display my conflict if I. Okay, if right, I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes, I have a place. Well, you can add it on to the okay. pies. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think right, that, um, I'm not really sure. I, I'd have to check on that. That would be a license commission. Um, but I don't think our vote would alter be altered anyway. I no, no, I, I, I'm just curious if MGL, it stipulated <coughs> all dimensions of beer and wine licenses, including seasonal ones, which, we'd have to check. which were a Massachusetts check. anomaly anyway. That, it's true, yeah. it's true. And they can be converted because of the special act that we have. Right. So, um, so let me, uh, we can certainly check into that um, and provide you with some information on that. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, let me read this puppy into the record. I really should. Um, yeah. As fast as possible. This is in the City Council, December, December uh, 5th, 2019, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz and the License Commission, ordered that 18184 in order to accept Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 12, permitting cordials and liqueurs. Whereas, Massachusetts General Law Chapter 138, Section 12, includes the following paragraph, stating, in any city or town which votes to accept the provisions of this paragraph, a common victualler who holds a license under this section to sell wines and malt beverages may, upon written approval, also sell liqueurs and cordials pursuant to said license subject, however, to all other licensing provisions of this chapter. And whereas liqueurs and cordials are defined as flavored spirits, a uh, product containing not less than 2.5% by weight, sugar, dextrose, levelose, uh, or a combination thereof made by mixing or redistilling any class or type of spirits with or over fruits, flowers, plants, or pure juices therefrom or other natural flavoring materials, or with ex extracts derived from infusions, percolation, or maceration of such materials. And whereas the City of Northampton's acceptance of this provision will support local wine and malt license holders who wish to expand options for their customers while supporting the overall strength and vibrancy of our local economy. And whereas upon acceptance of this provision, any establishment seeking to serve liqueurs and cordials in Northampton would be required to obtain a license from the License Commission and approval from the Massachusetts Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission, ABCC, and so that now therefore be ordered that the City of Northampton accepts the paragraphs, paragraphs of Section 12 of Mass General Law Chapter 138, allowing a common victualler who holds a license under Section 12 to sell wines and malt beverages to, upon written approval, also sell. Oh, uh, 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 to, upon written approval, also sell liqueurs and cordials pursuant to said license in all other licensing provisions of Master and Law Chapter 138. Any further discussion on this? Roll call, please. Councilor Twice. Yes. Councilor Twine. Yes. Councilor Labar. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Goodwell. Yes. Yes. Okay, approved in, in first reading. So we'll be back in two weeks to uh, vote in second reading. Thank you for your time tonight and your patience. And now we're going to move swiftly along to uh, something else. Shall we do committee on city? Shall we recess for? Uh, at this time, we're going to recess for the meeting within a meeting of the committee on city services chaired by Councillor Carney. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'll just note that the reason we're meeting in, the, in this city council meeting is our scheduled for Monday, which was the height of the snowstorm, and we couldn't make a quorum, and we wanted to attend to these uh, various appointments. So um, first of all, oops, here we go. 
I will ask, I will uh, ask the council clerk to read the roll, please. Councillor Carney. Present. Councillor Labarge. Present. Councillor Nash. Here. And Councillor Bidwell. Here. Thank you. And um, I don't see that there's any public comment that I'll ask anyway for this meeting. And hearing none, is there a motion to approve the minutes? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. And so, um, again, the one of the primary uh, functions of the Committee on City Services is to advise and consent on appointments forwarded to us uh, by the mayor. And it's been um, really, uh, for me, a very satisfying experience to meet so many people who are willing to serve on our city boards and commissions. And uh, tonight we really just had the three that are also then on our consent agenda. And I will ask first our, our Councilor Bidwell to give a report on the appointment of Alec Bernstein uh, from 266 Grove Avenue for a term of 2019, <coughs> October 2019 to June 2022 uh, for a position on the Conservation Commission. Thank you. Uh, I spoke with Alec uh, last week, I guess it was. He is a Hydro Systems Group Manager at UMass Amherst. He has extensive experience as a uh, water systems engineer working at watershed level, country level. He's very eager to apply his background to uh, the conservation issues and the watershed management issues of Northampton and the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, he's recently settled in Northampton, looks forward to digging in, and I'm sure would make very strong contributions to the Conservation Commission, so I would recommend that we forward a positive recommendation to Council for Alec Bernstein for Conservation Commission. Thank you. That's a motion I hear. Second. Moved and seconded to send the name Alec Bernstein for a positive recommendation for appointment to the Conservation Commission. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that motion carries. And then um, we are taking up an appointment to the Disability Commission of Marilyn Clare of 256 Pleasant Street for a term November 2019 to June 2022. And Councilor Labarge. Thank you. Um, I had a lovely talk with um, <coughs> Marilyn on the telephone, very, very pleasant individual. And she told me that she does have interest in becoming a member of the Disability Commission. And she was formed by her own experience being disabled, using a wheelchair and a power chair. She feels that this experience brought to her attention some of the problems that can occur in Northampton related to being disabled. She has lived in the city for 16 years, and she really enjoys living in Northampton. She appreciates its beauty and its efforts that have been made to make the city happy and fulfilling place to live. She feels that what she could bring as a member of the Disability Commission is a sensitivity to the vulnerable and intense curiosity about the goals of the Disability Commission. She is retired and she has time to be involved. She states she has a good heart and she's very compassionate. She has a master's degree in clinical social work and graduated from Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. And she would be, and it would be a pleasure to serve on the Disability Commission. And I also recommend a positive recommendation to Full City Council. Second. Moved and seconded to send the name Marilyn Clare for the positive recommendation to the uh, full city council. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Thank you. And finally, um, to the Public Shade Tree Commission, we have uh, the appointment <coughs> of David Lukens of 45 Ridgewood Terrace for a term November 29, 2019 to June 2022. I mean, I'm sorry, Councilor Nash. Have me there. <laughs> um, 
Um, I had the opportunity uh, opportunity to speak with David uh, Monday morning when it was nice and snowy. We had time to talk on the phone. Uh, David is a, uh, a former Ward 3 resident who I know through his work at the Montessori School and also uh, his many thoughtful comments related to the trucks in Ward 3. and. Um, He's a lawyer uh, with experience around land protection, and uh, he also, he's already been immersed himself, himself in uh, uh, the issue of zoning and tree protection, and he's, he's preparing to you know, start that discussion once he's, he's on the Shade Tree Commission. So um, I, I think he's gonna be excellent, and I would like to see, send his name forward with a positive recommendation. Second. Moved and seconded to send the name David Lickens <coughs> with a positive recommendation. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, and I take it there's no new business, so I'll ask a Move final motion. Second. second. Moved and seconded to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all for your patience. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we're back in the City Council. We're gonna try and resume the rough order, natural order here. There are no resolutions. Um, quickly, item 10, uh, there is a request from the mayor to designate a member of the city council to serve on a census complete count committee, uh, which helps get a complete count for the census and underserved communities and, and so on and so forth. Um, I did briefly touch base on before the meeting. And what I was gonna suggest is we just nominate and appoint a counselor at this meeting. But what I'd like to suggest to the council is, wouldn't it be better just to wait 30 days uh, because if we don't, I, we have four people to choose from tonight, and whereas in 30 days we will have nine. Well, you may have, some of you may have nine. So that would be my, I think that makes more sense. So any objection to postponement? Well, just through the chair, is there any issue with that? To the mayor? Not, not from my no. conversation, unless no. you wish to add. I mean, maybe there'll be a December meeting that we won't be a part of or something, but most of the work, what, January to April, mostly. Thank you. So uh, I guess by unanimous consent, unless there's any objection, let's just not take this up. Um, and the next council can do it. Um, consent agenda? I was just going to move acceptance of the consent agenda. Second it. Okay. So it contains the following items. The minutes of November 21st, 2019. Uh, 19168 appointment to the Conservation <clears throat> Commission, City Services. Uh, this we received a positive recommendation just now. Is that that's correct, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, of course, yeah. <coughs> it's happened before my very eyes. Um, Con Conservation Commission, Alec Bernstein, 266 Grove Street, Northampton, term October 2019 through June 2022. Uh, and then further appointments uh, to the Disability Commission, Marilyn E. Clare, 256 Pleasant Street, number 414, Northampton, November 2019 to June 2022, to the Public Shade Tree Commission, David Lukens, 45 Bridgewood Terrace, Northampton, uh, same term, November 2019 through June 2022. Any removals? Okay, so motion on the floor, there is no debate. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 All those any abstentions? Now, yet another recess, this time for finance. Floor, will Unless we, we want to, oh, pardon me, Counselor. Um, do we want to, is, is there anyone here who's just here for the override? Um, okay. For Barra, probably. Barra? <laughs> yes. I know what I do for you. That's in finance. Is the override it's finance as well? It's in finance. It's coming yeah. through finance anyway. So, yeah. May I just ask a question? So the sure, what are you going to do with that? Oh, oh yeah, we, we're having a technical problem, yeah. Have we tried restarting? We have. Um, I don't have the ability to restart. I Sometimes I think that restarting the router helps, but um, oh. I don't think but tur just turning the screens off and restarting them again. I mean, if you give me the thing, that, I'd yeah. really take a shot. We just set this up for good, yeah, only yeah. because I have information that would be useful. Sure, helpful. sure. But, um, Try uh, it. We just see oh, exactly what's going on. Right. This is the dual monitor, sorry. This one, uh, this one, and then I just wanted to, like, sometimes you can reset them.
this an executive branch function? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 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 These are non They're monitors, but you can definitely need to be around them. It's not working. Okay. Sorry. Did that, did that work? I'm not sure you're able to. Because you have to get on to the. Um, yeah, to the chamber press. I found chamber press. It was on, it was on my phone. Show available on that. Okay. See, I'm supposedly on All right, are there other financial orders we could be doing now while we set up? Or? Well, there you go. Um, I was hoping um, the order of them were sort of laid out in a way that uh -huh. I was hoping we could. Um, huh. All right, well. Chamber Prezzo shows up on mine. I'm yeah. I'm on Chamber Prezzo. It's saying I can't reach the page when I try to um, okay. log under the Crestron, the Air Media. That one's gotten me. What's, what's, the input, what's the input on this? Is this HDMI 1 or HDMI 2? We may just have to do it low tech. We'll do our best low tech then. Um, You're a professional. Uh, and it's okay. theoretically all trained professionals, so. Excellent. So uh, we have consensus we're doing this the old-fashioned way? I guess so. So would you call the roll of finance, please? Sure. Um, Councillor Murphy. Here. Um, Councillor LaBarge. Present. Not present. Present. And um, Councillor Carney. Present. Excellent. Uh, first item is approval of minutes of November 21st, 2019. Do we have a motion? Motion. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. And then for financial orders, we're going to jump to page two, and this is 19183, in order to hold a special election for a $2.5 million operating override on March 3rd, 2020. Uh, this is upon the recommendation of the mayor, order that a special election be held in Northampton on March 3rd, 2020, and that the following question be placed on a ballot pursuant to Massachusetts General Law Chapter 59, Section 21C. Shall the city of Northampton be allowed to assess an additional $2.5 million in real estate and personal property taxes for the purposes of funding the operating budgets of the city and public schools for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2020? Yes or no? We have a motion put on the floor? Motion. <coughs> okay, and the mayor's here to go over it. Thank you, um, councilors. Um, as some of you recall, as part of my budget message uh, to this city council for the FY20 uh, budget um, that was submitted to you back in May, um, I had indicated that it was going to be my intention um, this year to um, put a question or seek your authority to put a question onto the um, municipal ballot, um, asking the voters to essentially renew the fiscal stability plan by passing a general override. Um, as you also know, I came to you in September um, to indicate that I had decided to hold off um, because uh, there was still some uncertainty, most particularly around the um, major education funding bill that was pending on Beacon Hill, the student, uh, what then became the Student Opportunity Act, um, as well as wanting to see if we could get a little more understanding of how the um, uh, marijuana uh, industry was going to shake out over um, time. So I am here back with you now. Um, I've put the order forward, and I wanted to just um, uh, provide you with some basic information about what I'm proposing. It's actually interesting. This is the original um, fiscal stability plan that I presented to this council uh, back in 2013. This is I've kept it in my closet uh, this whole time. Um, and this was basically the, the, the concept that we put forward. Um, this was the FY 2014 budget. It was essentially going to be a four-year uh, stability fund where we would pass a $2.5 million override. We would use some of that immediate revenue to fill gaps in our budget. We'd put the rest in what we were, we didn't really know what we were going to call it, but it eventually became the Fiscal Stability uh, Stabilization Fund. Um, and then we would use in the second year some of that revenue uh, and put some of it away. Um, and then eventually, um, we would use what we had stockpiled to kind of buffer um, uh, the, the next fiscal year to give us stability over the course of, of hopefully four years. Um, and this is something that I've um, updated every year and talked about in all of my budget messages. 
Um, as you know, we've been able um, to extend it uh, beyond that initial period um, through a combination of things that I've spoken with you about during the budget season, including economic growth, including our ability to uh, keep health care costs low, um, and, a, and a series of other um, changes that we've made. So um, we've been able to extend it. We've also had um, the ability to extend it, I would say, one year longer at least um, because of this new local revenue source uh, that has come to us in the form of the uh, retail marijuana because that was an infusion um, in, our, in our budget for this fiscal year, um, and it's providing us some additional revenue um, going forward. So. Um, so, holding true to form, I've put together another uh, board, which, uh, which is basically, you have a copy of, but this is just kind of a big uh, version of it. We use the same format that we've continued to use, um, and basically we're, we're showing a $2.5 million override, how it gets plugged in, um, and it works pretty much the way we've, um, uh, we've done this uh, uh, for the past six years. Um, where we've tried to make projections uh, based on our, um, our best estimates using sometimes uh, multi-year averages of where um, uh, receipts have come in. Um, in the case of expenditures, we've looked at what our needs are in terms of our commitments to our employees in terms of collective bargaining, um, other expenses, again, relative to what our um, history has been. Um, and we basically created what we think is a prudent fiscal model. Again, um, the first year of the override, we use some of the 2.5 million um, to basically fill our, our budget and be able to fund the budget, but we put some of it away. Um, second year, uh, the same thing. Um, and then uh, we then rely on the fiscal stability fund to kind of backfill um, the budget in the out years. Um, we believe that based on our current projections, uh, the 2.5 million will allow us to get four more solid fiscal years of stability um, out of, um, uh, you know, again, um, moving forward. The, um, the projection that we were showing, um, just want to pull this up. I had slides that were going to be on the screen, and now I'm looking at them really small, so it's hard for me to refer you to them. But essentially, um, again, uh, we would, we would, um, you know, we would uh, put money into the fund in 2021, in 2022, and then we would start to draw in 2023, 2024. We'd then be able to do pretty much draw the rest of it in 2025, but then we would start to show a deficit again. So that's kind of um, what, what it shows in terms of what our projections are. If we did not do this, um, and I had a slide that I was going to show you, which is sort of like if we decided we're just not going to renew the fiscal stability plan, we're going to abandon that idea, we're going to... Um, and not pass an override. Um, essentially, we would be looking at um, a deficit, uh, deficits beginning in 2022, and they would get deeper and sharper um, in 2023, 2024, 2025, um, because we basically would, um, we'd sort of go off the cliff, as it were, and we'd completely <coughs> drain the fiscal stability fund pretty much in one year, and then we wouldn't have enough to sustain us for even a second year. Um, so it's kind of the, the, what I've been talking with you about over the last several years, it's sort of the roller co coaster analogy. You kind of go up slowly, but once you, once you decide to make the descent, um, it goes fast. And so, so what I'm, what I'm um, I guess what I want to have the opportunity to do is go back to the taxpayers and be able to say to them, um, we, we came to you back in 2013. We presented not only an override, but we presented a multi-year model. Um, and we've stuck to that, we've, uh, we've, we've uh, been transparent about it, we've given you um, regular updates on it, we've done everything we can to make it last, we have made it last, um, and now um, I'd like the opportunity, f we basically have a choice um, what we want to do going forward. Do we want to maintain um, the services we've created? Do we want to maintain the level of service, the quality of uh, schools and all the other things that our general fund supports? Um, um, and if we don't want to do that, then we're going to have to make some choices um, over the next several years about how we bring our budget in line. And again, the fundamental thing that underpins this is what we've been talking about again for seven years is the, is the, um, it, 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 the math of being capped, having your local revenue capped at 2.5%. 
um, and having your fixed costs rising, um, you know, cost for labor, cost for materials, cost for asphalt, cost for health insurance, rising at a much higher uh, margin. And at a certain point, um, the separation becomes too far and you have to start <coughs> making cuts. Um, in terms of the two items that I've heard the most about, and it's the reason I delayed, the, um, the legislature did pass the landmark uh, Student Opportunity Act, and it was landmark in the sense that it did make some significant reforms um, in terms of the foundation budget. Um, it did enact some of the most significant um, shortcomings of how the foundation budget uh, was being implemented, um, but primarily it was focused on um, some of the poorest communities in the state. Um, who have some of the highest need and some of the high, lowest income populations. Um, and so in terms of how that will affect Northampton, um, it's not going to have a very significant impact for us um, uh, in, in 2021 and really over the seven years of the phase-in. Uh, we received information from our, from our legislators. The Mass Teachers Association recently put out a, a document, an interactive map where you can actually go and see what you would get under the new bill, um, and essentially, it's a, it's we would be receiving about a one percent increase in Chapter 70, which is what we've been receiving. Um, if you if you look at the map, the MTA map, we would get eighty one thousand dollars in new aid next year. Um, so there's actually so that's so the, obviously that's problematic. The other issue that didn't get corrected in the Student Opportunity Act was obviously the issues around charter school and the way charter schools are funded. Um, there is a commitment in the act to fully fund mitigation over three years to get to full funding. Um, it's a commitment. Um, obviously, that still has to be appropriated. But there's still some fundamental issues that um, minimum aid um, was set by this bill at $30. So the minimum aid per student will be $30 per child, um, uh, which means you basically take the number of students that you get in our case, it's like 25, 2800 times it by $30, and that's how much new aid you're going to get every year, um, which for us is the $81,000. So the challenge becomes if we're still getting growth in our Chapter 78 of only 1%, and charter um, outgoing is going up at a much higher rate, then we're going to basically continue to be in this net negative category that we've been in, which is like when you when you add it all up, um, the education aid going in and going out, we actually are a net negative community, and there's a number of communities. So there's still work to be done. Um, I, I don't want to in any way discount the significance of this bill. I support it, um, but it's not the magic bullet in terms of finances for the city of Northampton, unfortunately. Um, and again, you can go to various uh, folks have been analyzing the bill and Mass Teachers Association, the MMA, others have been doing it, and um, as best as we can tell, that's going to be the impact for Northampton. Council of Orange. Did you say 1% we're only getting? Um, we are estimating that the increase in our Chapter 70 in year one would be about 1%, yes, which works out to be this 81,000. Um, there's also some Chapter 70 that comes to Smith Vogue, so it's, I think it's a total of like 84,000, but again, you know, it's 81,000, you know, on a, an appropriation to NPS, which is, you know, 34, you know, 32 million, um, and it's an even larger budget when you look at uh, the overall budget. So 81,000 on, on a $32 million dollar appropriation is, is, uh, is small. So, um, so the other issue I want to talk about, because I've heard, uh, is um, what about the impact of marijuana revenue and why isn't that going to help us or save us? Um, and I would say it is helping us and it has saved us in the fact that, you know, we've been able to extend um, the time by at least an additional year because of that additional 1.2 million in revenue that we were able to build into uh, this year's budget. Um, we are slightly increasing our projection cautiously for marijuana revenue based on the first full year of information. We're going to be moving that up from 1.2 to 1.8. It's still less than what we got in real revenue, but we feel like we need to move it up to be more realistic. And again, we don't know what the out years will hold when there's more retailers around the state, but we know that that's going to help us. And then the other thing is I'm going to ask you um, in another order later tonight, 
um, to take that revenue, that marijuana revenue that we got in FY19, and this was sort of the revenue that was very confusing to people because the sales happened, everything happened, but unfortunately because the industry started in November, every city and town had already set their budget, had already you know, set their tax rate, had already, and so any of that revenue couldn't be utilized um, in real time in FY19. So basically we had to wait until it flowed to free cash and then, uh, then it comes to us now at the end of the year. So what I'm gonna recommend, and it's in an order later, when we're taking some of our free cash and moving it around, is that we take that retail marijuana money and we put it into the fiscal stability fund, um, which will have the effect of lowering the size of the override that we need to actually ask for. If we didn't have that money, if we didn't have that, it's about $980,000, we'd be probably needing an override in excess of $3 million. So. Um, for those people who say, what about the pot money? I say, thank goodness for the pot money because it's actually helping us. It's not gonna solve all of our issues, um, but it is very much at play in our projections. And, um, and so that's in here as well. So again, um, this isn't really a, a vote about the budget for 2021. It's really a vote about this is the mechanism, the only mechanism we have for allowing our residents to make, our taxpayers to make a decision about whether or not they wanna exceed the limit of two and a half, prop two and a half, um, and allow us to raise more revenue um, for our city and schools. So I'm asking you to give that opportunity for the voters to weigh in on this. And, um, and my goal, you know, if this is adopted in the month of December, um, is to go out to every ward in the city uh, beginning in January and have town hall meetings and really talk to people about what we've done with the, with the monies they gave us before um, and, and how we plan to, to model and use these funds going forward prudently, but again, with a mind towards how do we preserve the excellent city services, the excellent city schools, how do we maintain our infrastructure, how do we keep um, paving roads um, when we're not getting, we're, when, when our state aid for road uh, repair is not keeping pace for, from, with inflation uh, from the state, we've got to have to take our own, our destiny into our own hands as it were. So that's what I'm asking you to do. This is the preliminary um, multi-year plan that would go along with it. And, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about it. Questions. I also just wanted to say, you'll also have another order later which we can talk about where we are mindful of um, the impact particularly on low-income seniors in the community so we're also recommending a series of adjustments to our low-income um, exemptions for low-income seniors which are allowed under state law and we um, we've done a lot of research on how we can tweak those and raise those and change those so i just want to let people know that we are mindful that this has impacts and we want to also mitigate them to the extent possible Questions, Councilor Lavarge. When are you planning to come out to the wards? Well, I was thinking uh, probably uh, again. Your second meeting is um, getting into the third week of December, um, and then my thought would be to try to work with people in the new year to come out because um, it feels like it'll be so close to the holiday season right. and the New Year's that it'll be really challenging to do things in late December. Um, and, but uh, my plan would be to try to do it sometime in January, February timeframe. Um, obviously, I'll be coming back to the council and the school committee um, at the joint meeting in January, where we'll probably have um, more information uh, on some of this because the governor will have submitted his budget for FY 2021. I don't think there's going to be major changes here, but uh, but that will give us a little bit more information. But um, but the fundamentals are, are what they are, and we sort of know what they are, and they're what most cities and towns are facing. Um, and so this is the only mechanism we have um, to, to be able to, to make that decision on our own. So, Councilor, I will, I will certainly work with you on a Ward 6 related, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, town hall meeting at Ryan Road or wherever we decide to do it. I'll, I'll happily do that. But I, I do want to kind of get through the holidays because I feel like people are so busy and distracted um, with that. And then once we get beyond that, we can do it. Councilor mm -hmm. Klein? Um, I'm wondering if you have the, <clears throat> the numbers um, 
that were in play in 2013 about kind of what the average amount is? For yes, I do. Actually, I do. And that's, um, that's important. It's actually, uh, it's, it's interesting because, so basically, um, it's at the bottom of your chart. So w it would basically add um, 67 cents to the tax rate. So the two and a half million would add 67 cents to the tax rate, the per thousand tax rate. So our tax rate was just certified. Sixteen dollars and eighty cents. It actually went down. Um, uh, it was seven, seven, thirty-seven, thirty-seven. Yeah, yeah, it's late. Yeah. Um, but it actually went down after we got our tax rate certified. Um, so it would add sixty-seven cents. And for the average single-family home um, in Northampton, um, which we estimate to be valued at three hundred and thirty-five nine forty-six, it would add two hundred and twenty-five dollars and twenty-five cents. Um, so that's sort of what it would do. It's, and it's, again, fascinating because if you go back and look at the one that we asked for in, um, in back in 2014, it added 79 cents to the tax rate, and it was $235, roughly. So it's very comparable in terms of um, what it would add to the tax rate. And again, this has been now seven, going on seven years since we asked the taxpayers to do this. So. So that's what it would. Thank you for reminding me. That was sort of down at the bottom. Um, Other questions? Councillor Bidwell. Uh, so would you describe this as a maintenance of, of existing services budget for the most part? You know, I would, I would, um, I would say that it's, uh, I would say that in some ways it is, but it also I think is, uh, we are making some, you know, I mean, when you look at the appropriation, for example, to the Northampton Public Schools um, and look at the number that I'm proposing at a 5% increase to the Northampton Public Schools, um, that is the largest percentage increase to the Northampton Public Schools since the last override um, back, in, back in 2013 or FY 2014. It's actually the largest dollar increase It'll be the largest dollar increase to the Northampton Public Schools since 1989. So in 30 years, it'll be the largest um, dollar increase uh, to the Northampton Public Schools. So I, I, we're making a significant investment in our schools, uh, and we're obviously making, you know, again, we want to set realistic budgets that maintain um, the services we have and also maintain the staff and, the, and meet the contractual obligations we have. Um, so we have tried to understand and build in those um, those things, um, but in, so I, I, I wouldn't say that it's just a bare maintenance budget. I think we're continuing on the path that we've been on of trying to maintain excellent services, but the costs go up every year. So that's my, my answer to that. Again, we're not quite into the budget season where we'll then be looking at the budget, um, but obviously the timing of this is we're gonna start the budget season not knowing you know what the outcome of this is, but before I submit a budget, I will know the outcome. So I am hoping to provide some information to people about like what the, you know, what the choices are in terms of if we, if this weren't to pass, right. um, and and what how much funding that would entail, um, and again what the scenarios might be if it didn't pass. So you would imagine laying out for the voters implications of a no pass and of a pass, so there's uh, something to really compare. To the, to the extent that we can. And right. again, I want to be realistic about this, and I want to be, I've, you know, I've said um, from the start, I don't want to, uh, I don't, I want to sort of approach this not in an alarmist fashion, but really just approach it in a sort of, let's have a, ma a mature conversation about this. Like these are, here's the information, here's what we did in the past, Here's you know the data. Here's all the data we can show you from you know what we project our costs are going to be, and um, and give you an option. These are the sort of two choices that that the city can take and what the outcome will be. But I mean, certainly, if we don't have this infusion of funds, um, it's going to set the city on a different path in terms of where it has to go in terms of contracting um, in order to be able to to balance its budget every. More questions, uh, Councilor Dwight. I just, uh, point of clarification: I, 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 um, Some constituents asked me if I was voting to uh, pass an override tonight. So there, there seems to be some confusion on the in the public about what this actually is. And and so for the point of clarification, it's worth noting that no, we are not. 
passing an override. We're actually doing what is actually the whole, while I disagree with the whole concept of Proposition 2 and a half, the principles that were advanced and the way it was sold to the public when they voted for it was that this, it, at two and a half, as Councilor Jarrett elect had uh, mentioned, and as you have said, is structurally designed. It's not, an, it's not an expression of failure. It's structurally designed to make, to compel cities to go and ask their residents, do you like the services you have? This is what it's going to cost us to subsidize them, because two and a half means there's no way in hell that it would ever keep a pace with inflation at the very least it's usually clocked at three percent and we've done worse so what you're merely asking us is to give the voters an opportunity to hear from you to make your case and then for voters to decide as is prescribed under the the law of two and a half and um, make their choice so this thing that we're voting on shouldn't be particularly controversial. It is actually, it is an obligation of ours to put it on the ballot. Um, we're not endorsing it one way or the other, although I, I, I think there would be consensus here about the, the urgency and the need for it. And you have proven in, as we said, in the last six years that you've managed to, uh, you and Susan Wright have managed to physically manage the city in such a way that we've been able to sustain ourselves at a high-functioning level, uh, um, and and I'm, I'm hopeful and confident that the case that you will make uh, will be compelling enough to actually determine the outcome that we're looking for. And then I'll go briefly on my screed about how I think that that you know this this points to a larger, profound dysfunction that we have in the state. The fact is, all these things, we we. The reason those schools have to be subsidized that are poorer is because we decided that we're going to subsidize schools with property taxes. So if your community doesn't have the means because your property is devalued, you have subsequently worse schools. Wealthier communities, uh, Longmeadow, well, we'll use an example. <laughs> now that their now that town manager isn't here, um, <laughs> but has the highest tax rate in the state. Uh, and as a result, their schools are phenomenal. Their schools structurally, they have every gee whiz thing you could hope for and imagine. And other schools in the middle, such as us, find it more and more challenging, and you add to that, compounding the problem, this, the dysfunctional structure of charter schools and the whole concept of that. And so each, every now and then, uh, the city has to come and ask it from its citizens to offset and subsidize essentially a dysfunctional tax structure in this state, which puts less <coughs> of the onus on a progressive taxation system that taxes the people who are more able to afford it and allow us to provide the services that we all demand. You, you can be damn sure, I remember in arguments past, we had a number of people who were actually receiving pensions from the city arguing against an override, but part of their pensions actually compelled the issue. So, as I said, not very controversial. I, I, I'd imagine you're likely to get a unanimous vote on this, and, and we are not voting on an override tonight. We are voting merely to put it on the ballot and give voters the opportunity to participate. More questions for the mayor. Councilor Babarch. Yes. Um I was, I did a little research on <coughs> overrides in okay. Ward 6, and it's failed every time, every time. Last, well, the last time in 2013, when we worked very hard, I've always supported an override in my family. Things are very, very bad in Ward 6. The calls that I have gotten throughout the whole summer, all right? Well, in 2013, 6A, 642 people, no, on the vote. And 6B, very unusual, 536. And at that time, I had talked with you, Mayor, in regards to even the people that were living comfortably refused to vote for it. I think it's going to be worse this time. Okay. I'm just giving you a heads up on this. Okay. 
and it, it's not good in Ward 6 right now. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting with those residents and trying to talk with them and try to make the case for some of the things we've done in Ward 6. I think we can point to a lot of things we've done over the last six or mm -hmm. seven years in Ward 6, mm -hmm. just going through all the roads that you've been advocating for paving of, Burt's Pit Road, uh, you know, on and on down the line. That's an investment of tax dollars that we wouldn't have had had we not passed the override. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, improvements to Ryan Road School that we've been able to make, capital improvements. Um, that have been long overdue, other improvements to Ward 6. So I'm, I look forward to making the case. Um, you know, it's a community. We make decisions as a community. And if we want, uh, you know, we basically are making decisions about the kind of community we want to live in and the kind of services we want. And that's ultimately what this is about. So I'm, I, I look forward to I'm speaking just letting you that. know things are yep. very bad. Understood. It's mm -hmm. the worst. I've seen it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions for the mayor on this? Counselor. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I would just like uh, to opine as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I know that um, uh, I know my, my colleagues take this vote uh, very seriously. And um, I, while it's true, we are only putting it on the on the ballot or proposing to put it on the ballot. Um, that doesn't mean that the my, my colleagues would say would say this. It doesn't mean that this is not an important vote. I mean, from my experience, just talking to people everywhere in the city, every ward, um, I feel like people just part of people just want to know that you at least understand what what they're facing. Mm -hmm. And so, I want to acknowledge that now that two hundred and twenty-five dollars. For many people, it's not a lot. For some people, it's groceries for a whole month or more. And I think everyone around this table understands that. And sometimes that kind of phrasing is sort of co-opted, perhaps by people who are just hard no on something, whereas I'm someone who does support taking the measures we have to make under a very imperfect situations. But I at least want people to understand that uh, for a lot of that that the, the council at least gets that for a lot of people, like, this is really hard. And there are people who really struggle, and they don't have 500 bucks in the bank. <laughs> you know what I mean? I and totally so that's understand, Councilor. Yeah, and, and I know you, yeah. and that's the point I'm making, that I'm, I'm glad that you have been so thoughtful about this. And, and you, this is, this is not just money that goes into a, a, a bank account. This goes into the community. Mm -hmm. And so we get what we pay for. But I just want it to be acknowledged that for a lot of people, you know, this is something that progressives and, and conservatives probably agree with. For a lot of people, this is really hard. Mm -hmm. And so we don't make this decision lightly, even, even to put it on the ballot. No doubt. Yeah. And I so. don't bring the question to you lightly. And I, I know you read don't. all my yes. budget messages. I've been saying yeah. it's, it's the last thing I want to do. I want to avoid it. I stretched it out off, beyond the original timeline. Exactly. To your yeah. credit, so yeah. I'd so like I, to just. I totally understand that. That's an important comment I'd like to just make. Thank nope. you. I, I appreciate it. Other questions for the mayor on this question? Then, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. I was just going to say that you know that's an average. We will put a calculator together so people can take their actual value of their home and plug it in and actually see how it will actually because the problem with averages is it's an average so mm -hmm. um, it can't just be universally applied but it's the best we can do no, the because the value of the city changes every year so that and every that property is value every different. every fiscal year the impact will be different exactly. depending on the value of the yes. city all right the next is 19185 this is an order uh, as mentioned to adjust property tax exemption eligibility requirements for seniors under Mass General Law Chapter 59, Section 5. Whereas the general fund operating override uh, to renew the f fiscal stability plan has been proposed for fiscal year 2021, and whereas property taxes can pose a significant financial challenge for some senior residents with limited or fixed incomes, and whereas in order to lessen the potential impact of the proposed override on seniors with certain, in with certain income and asset limitations, the mayor recommends adoption of additional property tax relief provisions for income eligible seniors allowable under Mass General Law Chapter 59, uh, Clause 541C. Order that. 
the exemptions for eligible property owners pursuant to the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter uh, 59, Section 5, uh, Clause 41C be adjusted beginning fiscal year 2021 uh, per the statute as follows. Reduce the requisite age of eligibility from 70 years of age down to any person age 65 or older. Increase the maximum exemption amount from $650 to $1,000 per year. Increase the income limitations for eligibility from $18,000 for a single and 20,000 for a married person to 20,000 for a single and 30,000 for married persons and increase the asset limitations for eligibility from 28,000 for singles and 30,000 for married persons to 40,000 for singles and 55,000 for married persons. Do we have a Make motion to put on the floor? Second? Second. All right. So this is, um, these are some of the ways that we can mitigate um, the impacts, particularly on low-income seniors. This is under MAPS general law. Um, we do have these exemptions in place, um, but what we want to do is bring forward within the boundaries of the law some changes and, and broaden those exemptions. So the first and foremost is lowering the age um, of eligibility. So you don't have to be a 70-year-old low-income senior. You can be 65 years old. Um, Increasing the amount of the exemption right now, we ha we have it set to 650. We would raise it to the to the $1,000 uh, level that could be exempt from property taxes, and then we've made adjustments for the um, for the income limits. And I want to thank um, Susan Wright and actually our principal assessor Joan Serafin. Um, this has been a project that they've been working on, um, and it's something that. Um, Joan, uh, Mrs. Serafin knows quite well because she works with all of the folks who come to her for abatements and come to her for uh, low income exemptions and she processes them. Um, and so she was really helpful in helping us work to set these, um, set these numbers where to sort of bring them up to date a little bit from when they were last adjusted. So um, that's what this would do. Um, and again, sort of as part of that package, we want to assure um, our low-income seniors that we're doing everything we can to provide some relief to them within <coughs> the bounds of the law. Um, obviously, we also have the, the tax work-off program as well, which we've increased over time. Uh, but this is another tangible way that we can try to, pro to provide a buffer for our low-income seniors. Mm -hmm. Questions for the mayor on this one? Uh, Councilor Bidwell. Is uh, age 65 as low as the law will uh, permit? Is it the, you can only go up to 65, correct? Yes, yeah. that is okay. the limit. 65's I, I, I the limit, yeah. And, yeah. and my second question, if I may, is um, mechanically, how does, how does this, the, the, the budget assumes a certain amount of property tax mm -hmm. levy. Yes. Um, and, with, and with these abatements that are, to a certain extent, somewhat unpredictable. Yes. Uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you allow for that in budgeting? Well, that's going to be an interesting question. We have an overlay account that, that is set aside for the um, assessors to grant various abatements. Um, do you want to talk about some of the calculations we've done? Some of them we don't know well what this will do, um, but we have some estimates that we'll try to work into the budget. But do you so want that to overlay assumptions are, are embedded in here? They will be embedded into the budget. Yes, yeah. indeed. Right. There's about. You need to come over so here. I think there's about uh, 90 people right now getting the 41C exemption. So the increase from 650 to 1,000 is somewhere in the neighborhood of about $35,000 additional cost to us. What we don't know is how many more people will now become eligible because of the age limits mm -hmm. and because of the uh, increase in the income limits. So mm -hmm. that, will be, that will be an unknown, but we've, I think we've covered it in our estimate that we're using for the overlay in the preliminary 2021 budget. So, okay. so it, it won't be insignificant, but it, it, it is something that we could manage. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor <coughs> Dwight, you had a question? Uh, when was this last set? Um, we believe 2009. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's, it's, been, it's been, it's been, it's in 10 years. years. Yeah, okay. 10 years, so we wanted to uh, go back and address it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? for the mayor on this one. Then hearing no further questions, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. And then back to our regular order.
This is 19180. It's in order to appropriate four million in free cash to various funds and projects. With the with the setting of our tax rate, our free cash is freed up. Um, so order that four million ninety thousand three hundred and seven dollars be appropriated from the FY20 general fund undesignated fund balance to the following accounts: seven hundred thousand dollars to capital stabilization, seven hundred thousand dollars to the stabilization fund, $980,414 to the fiscal stability stabilization fund, $500,000 to the OPEB liability trust fund, $932,187 to road resurfacing and paving, $240,000 to the 10-year data verification process for property assessments, $19,200 and $98 to the McKinney Veto Homeless Transportation Reimbursement for the Public Schools, and $18,408 to Central Services um, for the rebate for the EV stations. Do we have a motion in finance? Motion. Second. All right. So um, our, as we talk about every year after we close out a fiscal year budget, uh, we then have to work with DOR to have them go ahead and, and go through all of our um, actual um, uh, revenues and actual expenses um, and any of the unanticipated revenue or any of the um, expenses that came in lower um, represent what we call the undesignated fund balance or free cash. So we, this is what something we talk about at the end. And it, it typically comes at the end of the calendar year um, and it becomes available to us to use our, our strategy and our, our methodology over the years um, has been to to then take some of that and put it into our other stabilization funds. Um, so we're recommending, um, as usual, putting some into the capital stabilization. The stabilization, um, we're actually um, skipping down a little bit. We're actually um, requesting to put some into the OPEB uh, trust fund, which is our other than po post-employment uh, benefit liability. Um, we had a little bit of excess in our health insurance account this year, and we think it's appropriate to put that into the um, OPEB um, trust fund because it's essentially um, showing people that we're able to pay our future obligations in um, health insurance primarily. Um, so the key one here, which I already mentioned, is the is the transfer to the Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund. Um, that is the $980,414 that we earned in local excise tax revenue uh, collected at the register uh, for sales during FY 2019. I'm proposing to put that into the um, into the fiscal stability fund. The other area where we're going to um, use some of our uh, marijuana revenue is you also remember there was the host mitigation um, fund uh, money that can, that comes to us. That's an additional 3% that's only a short term, it's a five year. Um, and what we've designated that for, well, we, we asked you to set up a, um, a marijuana host community mitigation stabilization fund, which you did this year, um, but unfortunately you had to have had the fund set up by July 1st of the year that the, that the monies were created in order for it to go into it. So again, the other, this, these monies came in at the end of 2019, so they weren't eligible to go into the fund, so they just flowed to us to free cash. Um, what I'm recommending is that we take those funds um, and actually, some of you may recall, we did a number of uh, road projects in and around where the um, marijuana facility is located, NETA. Um, it was sort of coincidental, but it's, they were just planned at the time. So we did Hampton Avenue, we did Pleasant Street, we did Fulton, we did Wright, um, and we did Hampton Avenue, sort of a whole network of streets right around there, um, which totaled around $900,000 approximately in terms of what those projects cost. Um, so what I'm proposing is taking those monies and putting them back into the road resurfacing and paving account, which w I believe would hold to the spirit of the host community agreement that we were using it to offset costs related to traffic, parking, and other impacts of the opening of this new industry. Um, so that's what that represents. Of course, the advantage to that is that's now going to give Director De La Scalia, this 980,000 that she can use to pave other streets um, this year as she puts together her paving. So it's gonna have that ripple effect of giving her some additional money. 
The 10 year data verification uh, for property assessments is a once in every 10 year uh, project that the assessor has to do. Um, and uh, so it's not something we put into an operating budget because it's once every 10 years. Um, and so we are asking to appropriate this $240,000 that's going to be used by the assessors. It's required um, by the state. Um, and they're basically be going, they're gonna be going out and basically rechecking all of the properties and all the property cards um, on behalf of DOR to verify that all of our property cards and all of our um, information is correct on all of our property. So we think that's a, an important use of free cash. The other two are just um, common things that happen with uh, free cash, which is where you have grants um, that again um, get reimbursed after the fact. The McKinney Vento is actually something that gets reimbursed. Um, well, it's an NPS reimbursement, but because of the timing of when it flows, it actually comes to the city's free cash. So it's been our practice to basically give it back to the schools because that's really who, who the money belongs to. Um, and then the rebate for EV stations um, were, was a rebate that we um, earned as part of installing the new EV stations that were under a grant. And so this money would basically go back into the um, the Energy and uh, Sustainability Fund where we put all of our SRECs and all of our other uh, solar credits and things like that that we use to then fund green communities projects and other things. So we're basically sort of taking these two um, <laughs> refunds or, or refunds or reimbursements that could only come to us via free cash and putting them back where they belong. So that's what those two are about. So that's, the, um, that's what I'm recommending. But again, just to highlight, you know, two areas specifically where we're going to use the marijuana monies to stabilize our budget um, and then to actually um, replenish our paving account that, that we used funds to uh, pave a network of streets that have been heavily impacted and heavily used by uh, customers for the new um, dispensary on Con Street. Questions for the mayor? Pretty straightforward. All right, hearing no questions, and all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Two more. The next is 19181, an order to appropriate retained earnings to enterprise stabilization fund projects. Order that $1,200,000 be appropriated from the FY20 Water Enterprise Retained Earnings Funds to the Leeds High Pressure System Reconstruction that $398,234 be appropriated from the FY20 Sewer Enterprise Retained Earnings to fund ongoing wastewater treatment plant improvements, $31,000 be appropriated from the FY20 Sewer Enterprise Retained Earnings to fund a forklift for the water treatment wastewater treatment plant, and $200,000 be appropriated from the FY20 Stormwater Enterprise Retained Earnings to the Stormwater Stabilization Fund. Do we have a motion of finance? Yes, Second. Okay. So um, this is the enterprise fund sort of version of free cash. It's their, it's called retained earnings. Um, and again, it's after the DOR trues up their, um, uh, their budget for the year and looks at, again, all their revenues and expenditures. Um, they then uh, release this money. It's called retained earnings. Um, what we're proposing to do in a couple of uh, places is to put these uh, monies as we typically use them for capital related items into some key capital projects. Um, and you'll have an order, I believe, later tonight um, to, um, to rescind a, a previous uh, uh, borrowing authorization uh, related <coughs> to the Audubon Road uh, water tank, uh, which we approved borrowing from a little while ago. Um, and I'll just read a quick little summary. Drinking water for the village of Leeds is supplied through a high pressure system, uh, which includes a booster pump station um, and a t this 200,000 gallon water tank uh, to maintain sufficient pressure in the distribution system. Um, it was constructed in 1935, and the tank is in need of extensive <coughs> rehabilitation, including sandblasting and painting. In addition, upgrades are needed to um, the pump station electrical and electronic control systems. Um, and then since that borrowing authorization, we've done some further engineering review and explored some alternatives to the tank rehabilitation. Um, and actually, they have uh, found that there's a recommended path forward that would allow them to decommission and just remove the tank um, altogether. 
um, and maintain the required pressure to the system um, by re relocating a pressure reducing valve on the 36 inch transmission main and, up and upgrading the booster pump station. This will involve extensive water main work on uh, Route 9 in the Leeds area and the aforementioned tap into the transmission main to maintain system pressure with the tank removed. Um, the 1,200, uh, or rather the 1.2 million is actually um, turned back from the Upper Roberts Meadow Dam project that we ended up not needing because of grants. Um, and then, um, uh, and this is the, what we estimate is the cost to go ahead and improve the water pressure in Leeds without having to replace this 1935 tank. We believe it's a, and then it's a tank that you then have to maintain um, and secure and, um, and be concerned about from a safety percentage. So from a safety uh, perspective. So this is something that um, the DPW is recommending that they use the retained earnings for. Um, and uh, the next item is on the sewer enterprise retained earnings. Um, this is again, uh, that we wanna put this towards our ongoing, ongoing wastewater treatment plant improvement account where uh, we're in a 20 year um, improvement cycle on um, that facility. Um, the $3,100, uh, $31,000 um, is, is for a forklift. They actually have a 20, uh, 20 plus year old forklift that's failing uh, down at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, they use it to, um, they have this device that actually captures rags and other materials in a series of like these grates that, that capture them and get them out of the system and you actually use a forklift to then pick these things up and transport them. And, um, and they also use it to move other materials around. So the forklift is, and it's dying. And so they want us to um, uh, allow them to use these retained earnings to basically replace their forklift at $31,000. And then finally, the, the stormwater enterprise retained earnings, they just wanna put into the stormwater stabilization fund, which is a more normal uh, way to do it. But these are recommendations that come from uh, Director Lascalia. And, um, and I'm asking you to uh, make these transfers of the retained earnings in the enterprise funds. Questions for the mayor on these? No, hearing none. All in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, say aye. 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 Opposed? And the last one in finance is 19182 in order to rescind borrowing authority for the Audubon tank repairs. Order that the city council rescind the following order because such borrowing authority is no longer necessary. $250,000 of borrowing authority authorized under the loan order approved April 20th, 2017 for repairs of the Audubon Road water tank as the project scope has changed and funding has been appropriated to fund the Leeds high pressure system reconstruction. So motion to finance? Motion. Second. Second, and I think the mayor pretty much already answered our questions on this one. So any more questions? Can I just ask a quick um, clarification? So you said that the tank may or may not be removed? No, the tank will be removed. Definitely. Yeah, it'll be, re it'll be decommissioned and removed. Okay. Uh, the plan had been to rehab it, basically, and right. try to figure right. out a way to keep it going and fix it and sandblast it and stabilize it. Um, and, um, you know, it's sort of a way to, like, you, you bring the water up and then you give it some downhill, uh, add pressure through gravity. Um, but they believe that they can actually solve the issue through these um, valve changes and changes to the water main. So I think that that's just a better way to do it and not rely on this sort of older technology. Um. Any other questions about the water tank? All right, then all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 And there's no business, so a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Committee on Finance. So let's go through uh, the financial orders that you have heard about. Um, the first is 19180, in order to appropriate $4 million in free cash to various funds and projects. Motion to approve this. Move approval, please. Second. And seconded. And any further discussion <coughs> on this financial order? Uh, hearing none, let's have a roll call. Yes. Councillor LaBarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. 
as approved in first reading. Next is 19181, in order to appropriate retained earnings to enterprise stabilization funds and projects. Being approval. Second. Okay, made and seconded. Any discussion on these, on this one? Uh, roll call then. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Okay, approved in first reading. Next, uh, 19182, in order to rescind borrowing authority for aqua tank repairs. Okay. Made and seconded by Councillors Dwight and LaBarge, um, or vice versa. Uh, any further discussion on this? Then roll call, please. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, that's prudent first reading. Next, 19183, in order to hold special election for $2.5 million operating override on March 3rd, 2020. Second. Okay. Um, so this one has not been read yet, um, but let's just read it because it has the actual question on it. Or was it read? No, read it in finance. Read it in finance. Did you read in finance? Yep. Okay. I think I stepped out at some point or didn't notice. Uh, so it has been duly read into the record and uh, received discussion in the Committee on Finance. Is there further discussion in the full City Council? Yes. Uh, uh, Councilor Bidwell, then Councilor Labarge. Just to reiterate a point made earlier, even though the uh, hour is late, um, this is a very important uh, step that we take. In, just for the record, uh, it with great seriousness. Um, uh, as we go to the voters, which is a very important matter. Absolutely. Yeah, Councillor Labarge. Yes. Um, I think you've heard what I had to say. I have supported this ever since I've been a councillor. And Councillor Ryan, you're absolutely correct. There's many people out there that are going to be hurting very, very badly. And I know that. And even with the increasing that we're going to give the senior. That's not going to solve the problem with some people. And I'm very, very concerned about it. The amount of calls. My husband and I were eating lunch this afternoon in Northampton. And right away, two of my residents came up and said, don't put it on the belt. I've been hearing this all summer. Last week, two more people, teachers on my ward, who were actually crying that they have to get a part-time job. I cannot support this. The outcry has been huge. So I'm not going to vote for this. Um, OK. Any other discussion from the council? Um, all right. I think I've sp spoken for myself earlier. Um, hearing no other discussion, I would ask for a roll call. Please. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Labarge? No. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Okay, that is approved on first reading. Um, next is 19185, in order to adjust property tax exemption eligibility requirements for seniors under Master in Law, Chapter 59, Section 5. Approval, yeah. please. Second. Okay. This, this was read in finance as well. Yep. Okay. So any further discussion in the, in the full council? Sounds like ready for a roll call vote. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Okay, that is approved on first reading. Financial order on second reading is as follows 19172, in order to reprogram 60, uh, 1,660 from Academy of Music LED Lights to Academy of Music Handicap Ramp Project. Move approval, please. Second. Okay, made and seconded. Any discussion on this on second reading? Hearing no discussion, uh, let's have a roll call. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor uh, Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Um, now we have an. Um, a second reading order, an order exempting the city of Northampton from appointing weighers of hay, weighers of coal, and fence viewers. Move approval, please. Second. Okay. Any discussion on this? 
or jokes? We'll leave it where it lay. Good idea. Uh, so hearing no further discussion, let's have a roll call, please. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. And Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Okay, that's approved on second reading. We have already done the administrative order. So we'll move to, um, in order to execute contract amendment relative to fiscal year 2020 audit, before someone makes a motion, I'd like to explain this just very briefly to, to my colleagues. The city council duly um, awarded the contract for an independent audit to Scanlon in September. So we're all set with that. Um, it is my opinion that I would, in preference, that I would just like the council to vote on whether to sign the actual contract, which is neither an awarding of, a, of, of the job nor an appropriation of money. It's the signing of the contract. I want that because this one specifically mentions um, the, the, uh, the dollar amount, possible change. And so I have spoken to both our solicitor and finance director, and I am advised that in fact what I'm proposing is wholly unnecessary we do not need to, to do this. It's just my preference to have that extra level of council buy-in on the actual signing of the contract. If I wanted to, I could just sign this myself, but I think councilors know my, my preference is to have the council just do things together, okay? Now, having said that, um, I put this on the agenda. I, I failed to add this to the finance, agenda, finance committee agenda. So this complication I'm creating I would like to go to finance with a referral this evening, and then we'll come back in two weeks, and I would ask for two votes on that night, you just for this extra. Okay. Second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the referral? Then all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> and so now, we are, it's a zoning ordinance that is not, oh, with liqueurs and cordials we have done. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Yes, and so now zoning ordinance has not yet been referred. This is 19178 zone change petition to rezone three right avenue from um, URC to general business. Uh, process note, master a lot. Well, this is just the referral, but this comes at a request. People have this letter in their in their packets. Um, I believe on behalf of the property owner. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Right. All right, so that's what this is. So I would move to, to legislative matters and the planning board for good measure in case they haven't. Yeah, because it's on it. Okay, so those two bodies, uh, is there someone who seconds that motion? Second. Second. Any discussion on the question of the referral? Okay, all those in favor of the referral, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Great. So second reading on the following zoning ordinance is next. 19-149, an ordinance to rezone uh, 37 parcels from GI to OI and portions of two parcels from GI to FFR. Move to approve. Thank Second. you. And seconded by Councillor Dwight. Uh, you heard about this from our senior land use planner last time. Any further discussion on second reading tonight? Hearing no further discussion, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Um, Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Labar? Yes. Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Stepped, Stepped out. Stepped out. Yep. And Councillor Carney. Yes. Okay. So that secures the necessary support and it passes on second reading. Uh, now, more second reading ordinances. Um, 19, 136, an ordinance to amend chapter 312 vehicles and traffic to amend definitions of parking meter and meter violation. Second reading. Motion on this, please. So motion. Okay, made and second. Any discussion on this ordinance? Hearing no discussion, roll call. Uh, Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. And Councillor Carney. Yes. And Yes. <coughs> Approved on second reading. We have uh, done the Northampton Safe City Ordinance, and so we will go to 19155 in order to delete reference to the depot lot from section 312-110. Second. second. Made and seconded. Any discussion on second reading? Okay. Uh, roll call. Councilor Labarge. 
Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Goodwell. Here he is. Councilor Goodwell. <laughs> yes. Councilor <laughs> <laughs> Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Yes. Okay. <coughs> this is on second reading. Um, motion to defund everything in Ward 2 passes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, remove all parking restrictions. Yes, that's right. <laughs> sure. uh, what the heck? Well, I can't. There you go. Lame duck. <laughs> um, and now we have 19156, an ordinance relative to parking on Phillips Place. Second reading. Motion on this, please. Second. Made second. and second. Okay, any discussion on this? Uh, then I would so like to look at that picture. Again. I wish we could see <laughs> that picture again. <laughs> see the truck straddling the entire road. Yeah, man, try to get it. <laughs> There we go. No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just the same. What is it? Yeah. Still stuck in the same oh, spot. I saw that. Still there. Yeah. Still there blocking. I know. That's, uh, that That's qualifies awful. as porn for him. I think <laughs> it's a parking porn. Yeah. Councilor Murphy. Yes. There you go. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Goodwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. And Councilor Yes. Passes on second reading. Uh, two more to go. Second reading, um, 19164, an ordinance to amend Chapter 16, Departmental Revolving Funds to delete Senior Services Gift Shop Revolving Fund. Move approval. Move second. Thank you. Any discussion on second reading? Hearing no discussion, I'll ask for a roll call. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Goodwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Yes. And Councillor Murphy. Yes. Okay, that's that was proven in second reading. And finally, um, 19167, an ordinance requiring the use of organic pest management practices in the, in the municipal places where children uh, play. Move approval. Move approval. Made and seconded. So, um, first thing we have to do is sort out what version we are looking at tonight. I'll defer to the sponsor maybe to lead us through this. Um, I'd like to read it again as amended. How is it amended, may I ask? Or in um, what way? You want me to go through the amendments now? Well, well I want to, I, what I want to do is just understand how it's come to us. Yes. And then if there are further amendments, we must adopt them separately. Okay. So if you recall, it did, we sent this out to Legislative Matters. Uh, Legislative Matters made some um, fairly basic um, amendments that we um, we have in the packet here. It's the first one that you have in your packet. Mm -hmm. The second one is further amended, and these are amendments that came out of um, very uh, rigorous discussion with the health department uh, director and with the director of the DPW. Um, Councillor O'Donnell and I both had a meeting, a uh, three-hour meeting with uh, the department heads and the, also the chair of the Board of Health um, to really make sure that they were on board with everything. And uh, when we get into the individual um, amendments, I can explain their thinking and how we kind of came to the amendments that you see here. Some of, the, some of what you see here is um, fairly simple, um, and some is a little bit more complex, and we can go through them one by one. Is there something else that you yeah. were hoping so, for? Um, is it acceptable to the council to waive the reading of the ordinance that has come from legislative matters and just delve into the amendments that Councilor Klein has proposed? Yes. Waive reading. Okay. So again, it's a public document. Anyone can look at this, but it probably makes more sense if we then if Councillor Klein explains how she explains the amendments and reads them to describe how she wants the ordinance to, the, the shape she wants the ordinance to take tonight for a vote. Um, does that make sense? So the original is on the floor and has not been read technically, but Councillor Klein will read the amendments that will sort of substitute for it. I think that would be mm -hmm. in order. 
Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, and yeah. your yeah. intent is to uh, amend as we go, as opposed to amend in toto. <clears throat> I wish we had the screen working. Yeah. Um, but that's okay. Um, the amendments are not insignificant. So in a way, a, su a substitute, you know, after talking to the director of, of public works about this matter and incorporating all of her concerns um, and then going back and forth, it almost makes sense to debate a substitution. Um, and I suppose if, an, if the a motion to amend in toto fails, then we can go back to the original, I suppose that we could do that. Right. Yep, works for me. All right. We yeah. might as well debate the version that sort of has buy-in from departments and the council, yes. I would think. Well, okay. And I would assume that parts of this would inform other parts, so to amend from line by line would be yes, it would be fruitless. So, so I, 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 I defer to your choice on that. I think it's. I suggest that the sponsor sort of read the substitute, the, the language, the substitute, and there'll be a motion on that, and then we will substitute it, and then we will debate it. Um. I'm not sure if this is the right time to start with um, with an amendment in terms of sponsors, but I um, would like to amend the uh, upon the recommendation of myself, along with Councillor O'Donnell and Councillor Nash, both of whom are interested in co-sponsoring this. So that would be the very first amendment that does not actually appear here. Okay, so that's a motion that has been made. That's a separate motion. I would second that. No objection and am honored to be included. Thank you. So, to any discussion on that sponsorship change? Um, all those, in, oh, you I have can discussion? Make just a, a brief comment. One is okay. that uh, Councillor Nash, uh, of course, as my colleague on the on Skipper, the uh, select committee <laughs> yes. on pesticide reduction, has been very involved in kind of the uh, underpinnings of all of this and so it was appropriate for him to step up when uh, he was ready to co-sponsor it and I'm very grateful to Councillor O'Donnell who has um, essentially shepherded this process in in all different kinds of ways and was so engaged with it that it felt to me important to include him and I asked him if he would come on as a sponsor so that's just the my uh, the reasoning behind the addition of the co-sponsors we might lose votes if I'm attached. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thank you very much. So there's a motion on the floor. If there's no other discussion, we can have a voice vote on that motion. <coughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? Okay. So now the, the main substitution motion, I think, should be read. Okay. Okay. So should I actually read through everything, folks, or just uh, speak to the amendments? Well, I think what because it's effectively the first time it's being read in the okay. council, that you should sort of just read it verbatim as you propose it to be amended. I swear I read this before. Did you? No, because it's never been read in the council. So we're looking at, uh, upon the recommendation of Councilor Lisa F. Klein, uh, Ryan O'Donnell, and uh, James Nash, 19166, an ordinance requiring the use of organic pest management practices in the municipal places where children play, keeping children safe from pesticides. Purpose. The purpose of this ordinance is to safeguard the health and welfare of the children and other residents of the city of Northampton by protecting them from pesticides and requiring the adoption of organic <coughs> management, OPM, practices for the turf and landscape of the city's municipally owned parks, playing fields, and playgrounds. This ordinance, to be known as the Keeping Children Safe from Pesticides Ordinance, is designed to, over a period of, here is our first uh, amendment, um, uh, DPW Director Lascalia actually made the request that we shorten the period of time for the transition to organic management from four years that I had written in to three. So over a period of three years, reduce and ultimately eliminate the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides by implementing an organic management program in the places children play. Her reasoning behind this is that essentially they are de facto already managing uh, the places children play uh, organically, and so they don't need that full period of time. Um, should I make an amendment now, or did we decide um, we're doing it as a whole? I, I suggest that we vote on them all together. 
Right. Okay. Otherwise, we'll have yes. some right. that, yeah. Gotcha. <coughs> mm -hmm. <coughs> Children Safe from Pesticides Ordinance recogni recognizes that the use of pesticides may have unintended and profound effects upon indigenous and desirable plants, surface and groundwater, bees, desirable insects, birds, fish, wildlife, pets, people, and especially children in the vicinity of treated areas. It recognizes that all citizens, particularly children, fetuses, and people with immune deficiencies are vulnerable to the deleterious effects of pesticides and have a right to protection from exposure to the hazards pesticides pose. The city of Northampton recognizes that, is in, that it is in the best interest of the public health of Northampton's residents and visitors to reduce and ultimately eradicate the use of pesticides, and here is another amendment, and chemical fertilizers in the municipal places where children play. Um, thinking behind that is that uh, many people don't consider um, fertilizer, chemical fertilizer, to be kind of under that umbrella rubric of pesticides. So we wanted that spelled out for, uh, for true uh, organic pest management. Um, it's very important that chemical fertilizers are not used. Be it, ordained that by, uh, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council assembled as follows that Chapter 285 of the Code of Ordinances be amended to add Article 4, Parks, Playing Fields, and Playgrounds as follows. Uh, definitions for purposes of this section, pesticides means any spray adjuvant substance or mixture of synthetic chemical substances which is intended to be used for defoliating plants, regulating plant growth, or for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest which may infest or be detrimental to vegetation, humans, animals, or households, including fungicides, herbicides, rodenticides, insecticides, acaricides, nematicides, larvicides, defoliants, and plant growth regulators. This includes any fertilizer mixture that includes pesticides within it. Um, here is an amendment. Number two, we have defined chemical fertilizer means any inorganic material of wholly or partially synthetic origin that is added to soil to sustain plant growth. Number three is, uh, is also an amendment, defines broad application. Uh, means the spreading of pesticides over an entire area or substantial part of an area. Four is also an amended uh, <coughs> definition. Isolated spot application means a non-broadcast, generally non-recurring application of pesticides target targeting a specific pest in a specific location. Number five is also uh, a new definition. An uh, emergency situation means a serious and unanticipated situation that threatens the public health or is likely to result in significant damage to property or the environment and that requires immediate action and for which no organic pest management alternative is expeditiously available. Uh, number six, uh, and let me just, uh, <coughs> I think that the ones that I've read up till now are fairly clear because we added something towards the end that uh, demanded those definitions. Um, same for emergency situation, the one I just read to you, number five, um, that, that had appeared as an exception um, concept in the previous iteration, but we had not defined it. So this is simply the definition that, uh, that goes with that exception. Um, six, organic pest management, we found a, a kind of more evolved definition of OPM means the act of managing or controlling pests through the use of mechanical biological processes or through the use of natural, organic, or non-synthetic substances. Um, we have eliminated uh, the definition of municipal places where children play because it seemed fairly obvious um, and not necessary because we define the areas that need to be managed organically uh, in, the, in the body of the the legislation, the ordinance. Um, and public health, we eliminated as well because there is a uh, you know, broadly understood concept of public health and we didn't feel it needed to be defined ultimately. Um, seven uh, is uh, the same that it was. Pests mean any, means any agent, animal, plant, insect, organism, or microorganism targeted for elimination or control by a pesticide. Is everyone still awake? 
Yep. It is exactly <laughs> 12 o'clock midnight, the bewitching hour. Uh, one, one quick thing. I, yes. Um, it was, uh, the definition is broadcast application, not broad application. Oh, sorry. Very minor. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. That's because I'm trying to read too fast. Uh, okay, so we're down to now B, organic mm -hmm. pest management, except as provided in section C, which the, the letter had to change because of the change in, the, in something below, over a period of three that's um, changed uh, years from the date of ratification of this ordinance, the turf and landscape management of parks, playing fields, and playgrounds owned by the city of Northampton will be transitioned to an organic pest management system three years, so that's a change from four, from the date of the ratification of this ordinance, the use of pesticides on parks, playing fields, and playgrounds owned by the city of Northampton will be prohibited. C, exceptions. The prohib prohibition shall not apply, one, to properties under the jurisdiction of the Northampton Public and um, Smith Vocational School Districts. Two, this is uh, new, this is an amendment, in instances where the reconstruction of parks, playing fields, or playgrounds is undertaken, or in instances where the city assumes ownership and or operational control of a park, playing field, or pa playground where organic pe pest management practices were not previously employed, a three-year transition period shall be allowed in such in instances and at such facilities. Um, this was a, uh, this is an amendment that was uh, also suggested by the DPW director. She felt like we um, needed to make clear that something, uh, a new acquisition, or if in fact at some point, um, as an example, uh, the Northampton Public Schools will now be managed by the DPW, because they are not now, that they would have that same three year period um, to do the transition to organic management. Um, we, the next piece is completely gone from uh, the original and it talked about the public health emergency um, that would allow for uh, a waiver process to be triggered um, and I will explain that as we go on. So we go next to number three. Um, there's a, a missing word here, it should say in in the presence, so that's a, just a Scrivener's error, something that dropped off in the process of doing track changes here. In the presence of stinging, biting, crawling, and or flying insects that may pose an immediate threat to users of the facilities described in this ordinance, the director of the Department of Public Works shall have the authority to approve the immediate isolated spot application of a pesticide to eliminate the threat. Um, this. Uh, was clarified for us again by uh, Donna Lascalia, the DPW director, that uh, her concern was they needed to act very uh, expeditiously in a situation where, say, on a Saturday, uh, they get a call that a, a soccer team is about to use a field and uh, there are stinging wasps or some other pest that poses an immediate danger in an immediate use uh, situation that uh, she would have the unilateral decision to uh, authority to go out and do um, the definition that we have above, which is uh, an isolated spot spray, one-time spot spray of a pest that is posing an immediate danger. Um, and then number four, in emergency situations as defined in this section, the director of the Department of Public Works shall have the authority to approve a one-time broadcast application of pesticides. Um, there was concern that if we did a waiver process uh, that would involve public hearing, as we originally had written, that that could take you know anywhere between two weeks and uh, a month, and that that could be, in fact, too long a period of time um, even if it wasn't a quote unquote emergency threat, but more of a kind of urgent situation where there was uh, real danger. If you look back at the definition, um, a danger of significant property damage or damage to the environment that <clears throat> requires immediate action. 
So that allows the DPW director, and she, she is, uh, our current DPW director is really committed to, of course, having conversations with uh, appropriate people, such as the director of health. It's not mandated here, but we felt like she need to ha needed to have the authority to do that. This is the, this is the one piece, um, sorry, we're not deliberating. I won't, I won't talk about that until we deliberate. Um, and then five, within two business days after the application of pesticides as detailed in C3 and C4 are carried out. Um, and we actually need to, because uh, we did run this by the city solicitor, um, and he has clarified that we cannot ask the, pub the Department of Public Works to make a report to the city council um, so that this should read, shall make a report, so I'm on the floor right now making a suggested amendment. It should read, make a report to uh, the mayor and the Board of Health documenting the reasons why the application was necessary. We've removed the effective date because that was just extraneous because clearly when this is passed, it goes into effect. Okay. I'm so sorry to have at midnight um, sp taken all your time reading all this, but it's no, no, no. all very important. I think, I think you effectively read the original pretty much as it had come, if I'm not mistaken. Or maybe, maybe there's a different version, I don't know. But anyway, you have read it as you wish it to be adopted by the council. This document reflects that with the exception of the last part you just verbally stated about a report in one Scribner's error. Yes. Okay. So that is, I hear that as an amendment. I will second that. Okay. So made by Councilor Klein, second by Councilor Dwight. Um, one way we could do this is adopt it and then debate the modification as a whole. But any discussion on the amendment itself? One other quick Scrivener's error is under number um, C3, yep. uh, the presence the the should be capitalized. Okay. So that well, is supposed to be in, in the, the presence. presence. You changed, that was one. <clears throat> that was one of your changes. You modified it to, you wanted to put Yes, in. thank you. It so should capital I. In the presence, yep. Okay. Somehow with track okay. changes, things fell off. Okay. okay. So everyone understands the amendment. Any discussion on the amendment? All those in favor of adopting the amendment as described, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? So now to the uh, amended ordinance itself. Is there any discussion from any councilor? Councilor Dwight. I, I just, uh, uh, Councilor Klein, you were, you were going to opine on, on uh, what was it, C4? Is that right? You were, you were starting to opine and then you, you, you checked yourself and I'm interested in hearing what you had to say. Yeah, so um, thank you for triggering that, Councilor <laughs> Dwight. Um, this is the one amendment that I have really struggled with. It really feels to me like um, essentially what is a unilateral decision by the uh, director of the Department of Public Works is um, not appropriate. I would much prefer to have some kind of uh, waiver process in here, but in this three-hour meeting that we had, it was, it was really a struggle to figure out what that could look like. Um, one of the concerns was when we originally uh, talked about having either the having the health department or their designee, the health director or their designee, um, create some kind of waiver process. Um, Meredith O'Leary from the health department and the board of health chair Joanne Levin both felt like that would be putting in their hands one um, an issue that they didn't have enough expertise in. It would take them a long time to kind of get up to snuff in terms of the expertise they needed to, to make those decisions. And two, it would put them in a role that did not feel appropriate to them in terms of um, granting approval or not granting approval to another department, to a department head from another department. And, um, and then there was the, the major concern of if you have a situation that demands um, operational, uh, what, what was the term that, that Donna Lascalia used uh, over and over again? It was an interesting term, operational uh, expeditiousness or something like that, sh that um, 
that any waiver process that we would be able to put at this stage, if we don't have some kind of pesticide oversight committee that in fact has been recommended in the report by the uh, pesticide select committee, all the while that we don't have that kind of body that does have that expertise that can create some kind of turnaround time around a waiver process um, with expeditiousness, we would be putting um, in potential danger um, some of our green spaces in very particular situations. One thing I do want to say that I think is really important is that in very in-depth conversations that I had with um, Chip Osborne, who is the kind of organics guru in the Northeast. He's the person who, he lives in Marblehead. He is the chair. He has been the chair for 25 years of their Parks and Rec Department um, or, or committee. Um, he's, he's also the person that consults with Turi and uh, Beyond Pesticides and Stonyfield Organics. And so he does this national work um, with municipalities to help them transition to organics. He said in the entire time that uh, since 2004, is it, that Marble had passed their regulations uh, to transition to organics, there's been one instance where they've had an emergency situation um, where they needed to go through the waiver process. And he explained to me that this was also because the organics management hadn't been done properly in the first place. They planted the wrong kind of tree as a border tree in a, in a, um, around a green area. It became infested with a pest. Um, and they, they had enough time because it wasn't, they didn't have to kind of solve the problem right away and they had a month long waiver process. But he said in all those years, so in 15 years, is it 1994 or 2004? 2004. It is 2004. So in 15 years, they've had one situation of that level of kind of uh, threat. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of stuck on this idea that we should be able to create some kind of waiver process for uh, a situation so that it wasn't a unilateral decision by our DPW director. However, in light of the fact that we don't yet have an oversight committee and we don't have that level of expertise in the city, I think for now, for this ordinance, um, it is appropriate for us to, um, to pass this ordinance with that piece in it, despite my kind of misgivings. And I hope that if we do get to a point where recommendations from the Pesticide uh, Reduction Select Committee are taken up and uh, some kind of oversight committee is formed in the city that could serve as that waiver body, that this could be revisited. So that's my hope. So, Councillor, uh, just to follow up, I mean, as we've said multiple times tonight, of course, we make these laws not specific to the person sitting in the position, but the position. Your concern is that there may be some, they, there may be a DPW head who uses this as a, a loophole, basically, to, to self determine and determine um, uh, an emergency as it qualifies, and, and, and then just, you know, if it's an easier course for them or something. I, and I appreciate your concern on that. I, I share that. Um, but maybe it is in the hope that we, as you said, the object is to get, to plant a pole here, plant a flag, and then hopefully that um, council's continuing as, as circumstances evolve where there is a committee that would actually have the expertise to render a reasonable decision. This is probably the best way to proceed. Yes. But I do, I do appreciate your concern. Yes. yes, and I appreciate your framing it that way because one of the things that, because I'm rushing here because I know that everybody wants to go home and go to sleep, um, that I neglected to say is that, you know, I, I, I am really appreciative of what our Department of, our current Department of Public Works has done to date. Um, that, uh, you know, there was a decision by the mayor, and thank you so much, Mayor, for the Florence Fields man organic management. But beyond that, you know, very quietly and carefully, in a very carefully thought out manner, our Department of Public Works, and I want to really give credit to Donna Lascalia, but also to Rich Parcelletti, they have, um, you know, quietly and thoughtfully um, essentially implemented. Um, organic management. It's not kind of certified organic management at this point, and, and they have had a lot of wiggle room to, you know, use uh, chemicals if they feel like they need to, but 
by and large, they've really been managing our, uh, the places children play already as in, in an organic fashion. So um, we don't have a, a, a lot to do here. Uh, this is codifying it so that if that change happens at some point, we have a new, uh, new staff in the department that you know, doesn't have that same commitment. Um, we have this codified. So uh, it gives me the opportunity to thank the, the folks that are already doing this and also to you know, <clears throat> say we need to codify this so that when transitions happen, we can rely on the continued organic management. Yeah. Thank you. That's a big one. Uh, oh, and then the sponsor. Yeah. Uh, I would just like to uh, express appreciation to the sponsor and to Council President for slowing the process down to allow for this really, really good input um, from the folks on the ground whose job it is to implement this. I think it's a much more reality-based and stronger uh, ordinance uh, now that reflects that, that, that very good input. So I, I appreciate the, the slowing down the process. I think it's a, it's a very good ordinance. I would, and then I would ask if you might entertain a friendly amendment. I, the addition of chemical fertilizers, I think, is a really important addition because you're absolutely right that most folks would not consider chemical fertilizers to be in the same family as pesticides. And given that the title of an ordinance, we like to have it convey what's really in the ordinance, would you consider calling it the Keeping Children Safe from Pesticides and Chemical Fertilizers, and just adding that to the title? I don't know. Um, it, it feels a little clunky to me. I understand the, the thinking behind it, and I appreciate it. Um, I don't know if it's necessary, and I guess I would defer to my um, co-sponsors at this point and see how you all feel about That's it. That's a motion. I would second it. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I'll, I'll make it as a motion. Yeah, I, I second that motion. <coughs> sure. Board. I've already weighed in and am hoping that co-sponsors have something to say about it. Uh, I'm, I'm with you on the clunky. And, um, yeah. Thanks. So, we do clunky. Clunky is our reason to eliminate something. We, we, to be honest, it's already clunky. <laughs> <laughs> if you have to take a breath in between while you're reading it, it's still it's clunky. But I think I think Council Bidwell makes a good point. It, you don't want to uh, diminish the the same sense of urgency relative to chemical fertilizers, and if it's embedded in the title, that reinforces it. I agree. Any other discussion on the, the amendment? Um, all those in favor of amending Aye. the title? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? No. You're opposed. Oh my God! Okay. Oh. You know, it gets really vicious after me. <laughs> Man, that's really stepping oh. up. <laughs> Does it spell some kind of acronym otherwise? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it ruins Skipper, what, doesn't it? Buster, <laughs> like anti-clunk <laughs> contingent. <laughs> All right. Question? And so, Councillor, so <laughs> when we amended this, just for the record, it's understood by the council that we basically did a whole substitution. Does anyone yes. disagree with that? For, yes. for the, that can be reflected in the minutes just so we absolutely are sure about that? Great. So unless there's any other discussion on the ordinance tonight, are we ready? Oh, Councillor Cash, excuse me, you were waiting. Yeah, I just, um, I had a question for the mayor in terms of... <laughs> Perfect timing. Right on cue. Um, so we've amended this to where the report is going to go to you if, there, if, chem, if chemical pesticides are used. I, I'm wondering if you're compelled to share that with us or whether, I mean, I, I see that as, an, in fact, I was, I was going to speak to how I really like that part of the ordinance that the information was coming back to council mm -hmm. where we need to work further on this this issue. So anyway, um, uh, I mean, I think, I think this was an issue that came up twice during this around the, the charter. Again, we're back to the charter to right. me. And that there is a mechanism for requesting information <coughs> that the council has. And so um, certainly that information <coughs> would be available to council, the council asking for that But is there a way, like, if you, because we're not going to get notice of it, you will oh, get notice, could you let us know? It would be my practice to let you know. 
Okay. Um, That's I just, it just can't be codified. Um, I just don't, again, it's just, again, because um, then you're setting up a thing where the DBW is reporting to you. Right, and, and um, but they're reporting you to you and fill the I guess I'm asking. You could fill the ordinance books with all kinds of reports that they were required to give to the city council on everything and that's really not the way our system is structured. But you can request information and certainly given this ordinance, um, I don't think we're gonna have many waivers, um, but, I, but I, my practice would be to notify the council. Yeah. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. really good. Yeah. I'd right. just like to add to that my vision for this is that if we do, I very much hope that we have some kind of oversight committee in the city at some point. It could be part of their purview to on an annual basis or a biannual basis or however to um, request that report and you know come and report it to the council or have a conversation with the council about that as part of their work on an ongoing basis. But that's neither here nor there since we don't have that yet, but that you know, could be part of the vision for the future. Thank you, Council okay, Bidwell. Yeah. But, but in the meantime, to the, to the mayor's point, <coughs> uh, a request could be made every six months by, by the city council to ask the mayor to report on any exceptions in the last six months. Yeah. Any other discussion on an ordinance that perhaps we all agree on, I'm guessing? Councilor Klein. Um, another point of information that's a little bit neither here nor there, but um, feels important to me nonetheless, is that um, Stonyfield Farm, and I might have brought this up, I know I talked about it during uh, legislative matters, I guess I didn't have a chance to share with the whole council, um, has a grant program that uh, helps municipalities to transition um, to organic management of green spaces. And they provide up to $20,000 of in-kind um, training and materials with $5,000 cash to purchase uh, materials. And uh, Chip Osborne, this person that I'm talking about from Marblehead, is their lead trainer. And again, in conversation with him, he has a lot of influence on the decision-making process of who, received these, who receives these grants. Um, I put in a query, not an application, and um, I'm told that we have a very, very high chance, if we're interested in receiving this $20,000 uh, grant from Stonyfield Farms. And I have informed uh, Director Lascalia, she knows about this, but that's just one kind of way to sweeten the deal, as it were, in terms of our beginning of transitioning or kind of completing our transitioning since so much work has already been done. Um, and if, if the Department of Public Works decides to kind of pursue that grant more formally than my initial inquiry, um, it's very likely that that will be one of the ways that this work can be done um, without adding a lot of cost to uh, the budget. So I just wanted people to know that because I think it's kind of an interesting uh, possibility. Thank you for that information. Um, Councilor Nash? Yeah, I have more to say. I'm going to save it for second reading when Great, I'm sure you. of what's going to come out of my mouth. Sounds good to me. So unless there's any other discussion on this matter tonight, do I hear any other discussion? I, I hear no other discussion from the council, so I would request a roll call vote on first reading, please. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. And Councilor Yes. Okay, that's proven the first reading. Any new business this evening? No, sir. Is there a motion uh, to, adjourn? to adjourn? Second. Second. Are there any opposed to adjournment? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Good night. Aye. Or good morning. Oh. <laughs>